Hi, it's Cayman Reynolds. Welcome to the night's live chat. I don't have what might look like the Brady Bunch, but I got the beekeeping bunch with me today. <laughs> and we have a lot to talk about. It's a great time of the year to talk bees. Um, it's awesome to see bees brooding up and pollen coming in and honey uh, filling the supers in some parts of the country and the world. So uh, we're going to be asking some questions of each other. I hope that you all are going to be bringing some of your questions and we can get those taken care of as well. Uh, thanks for coming on, guys. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah. So, Bob, you're a little south of me. And for those of you who don't know, um, I'm in central, uh, middle, north Tennessee area. And, and Bob, you're um, northeast Georgia, correct? That's right. I am south of you, but I'm also higher than you. So time-wise, you know, how the season progresses, we may not be very far apart i don't know do you have privet blooming in your area bob we do but in yeah we do you know my region if you want to call it that it goes from north to south about 40 miles and also in elevation it changes from about 1400 feet up to maybe close to 2400 feet so wow um, we we probably have at least a two-week difference from our southern locations to our northern locations our southern locations, I'd say the privet is past peak, and the northern locations is just coming in. Interesting. Um, yeah, we're we're similar to your northern locations. Then um, ours is just starting to hit peak um, here, and and then Ian, you're up there in uh, Miami, um, uh, Manitoba, Miami. <laughs> <laughs> the cold one, yeah. The cold. One. <laughs> right above North Dakota, uh, straight. Pretty much straight north Grand Forks. I'm 22 miles off the border. I was really shocked one time when I just decided to see how far of a drive it would be from my house to yours. And it actually was not as extreme as I thought it was going to be. Um, you're not too far away um, from... It's 15 Dakota. hours or something like that. Yeah, it's a good day's drive, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, back in my truck driving days what's 15 hours you know as long as they don't look at my log books we're, we're fine um so uh got a lot of different questions some of them have been sent in uh beforehand and if you guys have any questions of each other or just have something that you'd like to discuss um i would like to do that one of the points of conversation i hope that we'd be able to address in this live chat is queen quality um queen cell size um, various things like that. There's been a lot of um, talk about that over the years. I don't have all the answers, so I'd like to ask you kind of your opinion on, let's start with queen cell size and kind of where is the the point of too small, too runty, and what's acceptable and going to make a good queen. Let's start with a hard one. <laughs> I got to hand this over to Bob because he's a master. <laughs> um, I, people think I know a lot about queens, but not so much, um, really. Too bad Chris isn't here. He could help us a lot. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, there is such a thing as too small. But, uh, uh, but you know, I, I saw some of your huge queen cells in one of your videos there, came in, And uh, I think there is a point at which it doesn't matter if they get any bigger. And those looked like they were probably at least two or beyond that point to me. Um, yeah. Obviously, you want them pretty nice, but uh, they don't have to be monsters. I, I don't know that you gain anything when they get that huge. They don't look any bigger than some that are a little bit smaller than that. Um, when the yeah. queens emerge out of there. And I find that almost half of the royal jelly remains um, yeah. after they've, <laughs> they've emerged. So... Um, Maybe the reason the cell is so long is because they've placed so much royal jelly in there that they have they have to build off of it. They've gone beyond the Jay-Z, BZ cup a little bit. I don't know, but um, that's the thing is I don't know. And so I just go for the biggest thing I possibly can create, and that's yeah. you know, what kind of where I'm at you with it. You can't go wrong, really, can you? Um, oh, you can. I, it can be genetic, too, you know. I'm I'm pretty convinced that Italian bees make bigger queens and perhaps a little bigger cells. 
I don't know what that means. I, we like to think that bigger queens means higher quality, larger ovaries or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm pretty sure that Italian colonies will make bigger cells and a little larger queens. I think uh, you know, we've had some queen cells that were about a quarter inch smaller than those jumbos that I, I showed. And the queens performed really good after that. Mm -hmm. um, how Oh, Ian's in the stream with audio only. Maybe maybe he's got to... Uh, oh, there he is. There he is. So he's back in. So uh, I was visiting a commercial operation this year, and I was really disappointed in the size of the queen cells. Uh, a JZBZ cup is, you know, I don't know, about a quarter inch or so long, and they were about a quarter inch off of that. And I was not super impressed with those cells. And lo and behold, over the last couple of weeks, I've heard lots of reports, not just from individuals, but some companies that have worked with them as well, that they've had exceptionally bad issues with their packages in Queens this year. And that's part of the reason I wanted to have this discussion. Is That's a, a big struggle for a lot of new beekeepers, um, who really are just getting new. They don't know how to make splits like you guys, and they don't have resources and assets. Um, so you get two packages, and one's bad out of the gate, and you got a brand-new colony. It's, it's hard to know what to do, and uh, I think being informed maybe about the situation might be helpful, if nothing else. One thing I'm looking for when I'm making queen cells, like I'm going through the builder, pulling them out, and I think – more so than size, I'm looking for consistency right across the board. Like if I'm looking at a frame of grafted cells and I see a big ones and small ones and, you know, blanks and just all the jelly, you know, halfway through and some filled right up and just that inconsistency. I don't like to see that, but what I would love to see is just a consistent row of queens, uh, queen cells. And, and then when I go through, I take out anything that looks odd and, and then take all the rest ahead. So that's basically what I'm doing. And like you're saying, this the size, I've seen some great big queens coming out of little wee nubs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'd wonder how she fits in there. And I had a, a well-known queen breeder out here, you know, multi-generational. They should know what they're doing. And she was saying, you know, the size of the cell doesn't, tell you everything as long as it's fed and developed properly as long as it's not sick with virus or anything like that or or any other these compounding issues but typically a bigger cell is going to be a better developed queen because they have everything they need the environment's there for them uh you know the wax was there from the young bees the, the building out all the uh the royal jelly everything like that so that's typically what we're looking for right so yeah. I have a question for Ian, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. Not every cell is accepted. Uh, do you have any kind of clue at all what your acceptance rate, in other words, how often or what percentage of the time do you think a colony actually does not accept the cell you give them? Yeah, I hear that a lot. And I'm going to bounce that back to you too, Bob. But when I'm putting my cells out into my nukes, we're not putting any uh, protectors around or anything. <clears throat> they take them all. Yeah. And we go through like two days after just to make sure they all emerge. And then we have some, you know, the queen doesn't flip or just for some reason that the queen never, never hatches out. Uh, so we replace them, but we never have the colonies themselves tear them down. I've, I, I shouldn't say never, you know, never is never. But uh, mm -hmm. what do you find in your uh, operation, Bob? Well, it's pretty good, I think. Of course, we do use those cell protectors a lot. If yeah. for no other reason, we use cell protectors just because it makes it so easy to handle the cells. Oh, there'd be that. And, um, and uh, sometimes we'll put cells in early, you know, after the nuke's been made for a day or two, and I feel like it helps, but I can't tell you for sure that it helps. I mean, who knows without checking them every few hours to see what they're up to. You know, here lately, I've been kind of following uh, what I learned from Kent Williams about putting in 48-hour cells, and that, that's very interesting. They actually will draw those darn things out pretty good and 100% uh, 
of them carry through and get the job done. You just have to have a really good nuke in the first place. You can't get a good sale out of a one or two frame nuke, but if it's a three or a four frame nuke, they do a nice job doing that. Yeah, that's exactly the point right there. I uh -oh. <laughs> uh oh, he was saying something so good. They just shut down all that Canadian reception. Um, so this is the queen cell protector uh, Bob was referring to right here. Yeah. Uh, so Ian, you were just fixing to say that's exactly or something like that, and then. Yeah, I'm, I bet you the kids are still on the internet here. I'm trying to tell them. Those darn kids. <laughs> Uh, so it wasn't that long ago, Bob, I was actually doing a live chat just myself. Um, I believe it was, it was just m me doing a question and answer one. And, and my son accidentally yanked the plug on our Wi-Fi, our, our modem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I just took it out. Um, but <laughs> you know, that's what kids do. Um, so I think I'm back now, right? Yeah. You, you're you're okay. back now. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, you're talking about those 48, uh, days or, uh, our cells and I tried doing that in my nukes one time too because who was it I think maybe I heard it from you Bob or somebody else Bob you know a video on it um for sure yeah it was it's an idea that was floating around there so I thought I'd try it and the problem I had was uh my nukes weren't consistent enough I had big ones and then the big ones did all right but then I had smaller nukes and though, of course they didn't draw out the cells proper enough so I figured well you know I've spent all this time building the nukes why don't I build these cells and and ensure that they have all the conditions they need? I know mm -hmm. by setting up that builder, I build them all the way out. I know they have everything they need right from the start, right to the beginning, or right from the start, right to the end. And then I can take them and put them into the nuke and then not worry about the conditions of the nukes themselves. Because we go through making nukes and we're like, quack, 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 and we're pretty mm -hmm. quick. So some are big and some are small. So we're, you know, some of those conditions might not be adequate to finish off that cell. Yeah, I'm not saying it doesn't work, but I just didn't have very much luck with it myself. And I think that's the reason why. Yeah, we, we run into the same thing. Big nukes, small nukes, drifting, whatever. Yeah, yeah, drift, yeah drifting. We So I have a... Well, and we'll get to everyone's questions here soon, everybody. Um, thanks for being patient. We're just going to kind of hammer this out real quick um, on these uh, queen issues. Um, so I had two yards. I placed them 10. Uh, it's the same location, but at different sides of the property. And it, it wasn't a lie. It was 40 mating nukes. I dropped one set of 20, another set of 20, and it was 10 days apart. The mating nukes are typically made very similar uh, they came from the same breeder queen, even came out of the same starter finisher and everything. Uh, the only difference was the date that I dropped them. I only got 40% exactly off of one of the rounds. And then the, the later round, I, I got uh, just only one miss and uh, out, of, out of 20. And, you know, sometimes just things don't work out. Um, that's <clears throat> the only thing I can figure because... Um, I actually open my queen cells up. I'm very careful about it, and um, I'll op I'll I'll pop in there and I'll, I'll look and see how the queens are developing to a degree. Not all of them, but I'll, I'll give a few a check and make sure everything's where it should be. And and Ian just left. Apparently, um, the the prime minister needed something. He needed to talk to Ian. Um, <laughs> But, Probably going to talk to his kids about getting off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know those. I have a yard that does that, uh, Cayman. Uh, I saw Seth is on here. He he knows which one I'm talking about. We call it the Skavarki yard. That's the landowner. Oh yeah. And we we have three kind of little spaces in the on the same property, and some of them are only twenty or thirty feet apart. And one group will routinely get 60% or maybe 70 on a good day. And then 20 or 30 feet away, we'll have another small group, maybe around a tree stump or a privet hedge or something that we get really good, like 80 or 90%. And they're just feet apart. And it, it, and it's consistent. It's very interesting. That is so weird. And yeah, these one of them is next to a fence line. That's the one that performed really good. It's, it's actually the fence line I had the first bees that I ever purchased. And on my dad's place and then we we got away from it because it's on a, a little bit of a, a hill and it's just too much work hauling honey and stuff up and down but then the other one i put down in a, a field of my dad's um, but it, it's in the 
basically in the middle of a field, and I wonder if the grass grew too quick, um, and and that could have affected because we just dropped the nukes right on the ground, and it w the grass was fairly low when we dropped them, um, but the other one we weeded it and then dropped them, and um and they definitely there was a, probably a three inch difference in the grass height to four inches, and I just wonder if that could have affected queens returning back to the mating nuke. I, I have no clue, but. Regardless, um, these are things that have been making beekeepers scratch their heads for a very long time, and maybe it's why we're so addict addicted to it is we just can't stop but try to figure all these things out, though we never will. So Seth is saying something. Well, yeah, all the ones I make take IDK? What would that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what Bob's problem is. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Bob, are you going to put up with employees talking to you like that? I put up with it all day long. I yeah, don't know I'm, what's new. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, you know, I talk to Ian like that, and I don't even work for him. Um, so, hey, Dave Dwyer um, just got his first nuke. So Dave's been following us for a long time and a, a, a long time friend. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for the donation, Dave. And I um, also want to say a big thank you to the other <coughs> folks that have uh, donated on here. Um, I saw them earlier, and they are – there we go, ECP. Thanks for coming on, Chris, again. What are your gentlemen's thoughts on marking a virgin queen, or should we mark them once they come back mated? What do you think, guys? Well, I don't like to touch virgins if I don't have to, and it's just me probably. It may not make any difference at all. They may be fine, but – I tell my employees, I say, don't, let's not mark them. Let's not mess with them until after they've made it. And, and it's just a theory. I really don't know for sure if it makes a difference. Yeah. I have a friend that marks virgins and they seem to come back mated properly, but I'm scared to death to touch like Bob mm -hmm. saying, like, I don't want anything to do with them. That's why I manage the sales because I feel there's a lot of things that go, you talk to Curry Stevens though, he'll tell, you know, relaxing and there's not as much going on as you think but i i just like putting the the cells into the hive and then have the bees care for that virgin as it comes out and feed them properly and provide all the conditions and pat it on his head and let it go and fly i just want to don't want anything to do with that process so i kind of shy right away from it but Corey's changing my mind on some of that and i'm i'm you know i'm willing to dabble into the you know the the murky waters of virgin queens so you mentioned something earlier about your mating nukes and, and going through first two things first of all you said that you dropped the cells um without a, a queen cell protector which i've done in, in the past I, i've honestly like bob said half the reason is just for handling because i like to place them in the jz bz um, little bars they just fit right in there and makes it easy to go in and out of the incubator and uh, then the other thing um, you mentioned is that uh, you would come back and see yeah. if they hatched or emerged from the cell. If we want to be technical here, apparently I say a lot of words incorrectly. By the way, so you'll have to forgive me for all my <laughs> terrible <laughs> slang. Um, I, I I'm getting uh, chastised on YouTube. Uh, seems like every other week now. L larvae. There we go. Larvae. <laughs> Uh, no, all right. No, larva, larva. <laughs> Lar larva, larvae, you know, it's one of those. It uh, dep depends on who you are, but I, I really don't care as long as people understand. But so you come back and check, and I don't like to, to mark virgins um, beforehand. I don't. I, I prefer not to mess with virgins at all. I'd love them to come out in that cell, not come back um, until they're mated, and, and then, then I can mark them or something like that. Um, but but you say you're, you're coming back and checking those cells a couple days possibly afterwards. What's up with that? Two days, yeah, just crack the lid. It's very, you know, we don't intrude very much. We just crack the lid to see if it's hatched out. And if it has, then everything's good. Lay them alone for about two weeks at least. And uh, if there's a problem, then we just drop another one in there. So basically... Let's if we say, have time, I mean, sometimes we're running and we just don't get around to them. So then we just take that 2% loss on that. I see. So essentially what you're doing is you're, if you were, if you had one of these, or if you just had the cup, you just tilt that, grab that 
look at it and see where the queen saw on her way out of there basically yeah we just pull it out and you should be able to see yeah all the way through it's pretty quick mm -hmm. other though we don't like to disturb the mating nukes once we put them in I see. especially me because once i start getting in it was like uh, dig a little deeper dig a little deeper and then you just it's, it's like um when you have little chicks and you have a bunch of chicks and a bunch of kids they're you know helping you care for the chicks you always have one or two that you always let the kids handle because they always overhandle them and they die and that way that leaves all the rest of them right <laughs> i'm mm -hmm. kind of like that with bees I, you know you know i need that hive to dig into all the time so i can just leave all the rest alone <laughs> so that's what i that what i'm trying to say is with the mating nukes the less is best once you get that queen emerged in there well interesting so i've never heard of anybody doing a check back like that but yeah i Something I found really interesting, and it was Chris Warner. I'm pretty sure I watched one of his videos, and it was probably on Bob, your channel. I'm forgetting where I've seen this, but he, he actually, before he puts them in, he checks them. He, he pulls them up, apart and takes a look and puts them back together. That's Chris Warner who does that, right? Yeah, he, he does. Well, they do that if they're suspicious of anything. They only do it if they think, you know, if they candle them and it doesn't look right, then they take them apart to look. I saw that. I was shocked. I mean, I'd never seen that before. And he said, well, it's not a uh, sterile environment. You know, what's the problem? And I guess he's right. Yeah, it was very interesting because that'd solve a lot of issues. You can you can make a very accurate call yeah. at that point of time. So I thought that was neat. So I actually do that a lot these days. Um, I didn't used to. Um, it's one of those things... Um, Corey Stevens was the one that showed it to me, and I was just like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, we're supposed to be babying these things like you know they're they're fragile eggs." And uh, instead, uh, he's just like, "Pop that sucker open. Yep, that pupa looks pretty good. A pupa looks good, and throw it together, and and it'll be fine." And so all of the queens that I got from Corey Stevens uh, last year, I I believe it was like seventy five queen cells i went up to missouri took my incubator brought them back every single one of those had been opened by either him or or myself i got over 80 percent take out of those um in july and i thought that was pretty good given the location and then um i do that fairly frequently i don't typically do all of them i just don't have the time for it but if i have yeah any that cells just a little discolored at the tip i'm definitely opening that one and it's interesting where sometimes you'll see a monster cell and you're like oh man that's got to be a great queen in there and sure enough it's either come dislodged too far from the royal jelly at some point or something is going on and, and that would have just been the, a waste of a mating nuke i'm gonna have a problem this year with my mating um or my queen rearing like I, i've I had a tough spring and I've had a lot of nosema, and the nosema's flared up, and that's one of the reasons why my colonies have kind of not collapsed but dwindled in a lot of ways, and now I'm just kind of rebuilding from that. <clears throat> and I, I track my diseases. I track uh, uh, fungal infection and bacterial and mites and virus, and I have my viral uh, analysis back, and I have a lot of black cell queen virus residing within my 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 bees so i'm not sure how that's going to affect and just like that like a fart in the wind he's gone <laughs> hmm. i hope my mom's not watching this <laughs> uh, so i want to say a big thanks to ihxlh um, for your donation ian we you're just getting to the <laughs> crucial point and now we've just been on the edge of our seats <laughs> Talking about black cell queen virus um, because of my heavy nosema infection. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that because I'm looking at the level of black cell queen virus residing within the bees and it's a severe infection. So what I'm going to have to do if I'm going to rear queens this year is um, well, when I build these builders, we'll first off build them on a clean comb, of course, but I'm going to have to treat them with fumagillin or something to try to manage the virus by managing the nosema, but whether managing the nosema is going to clean up the virus in time to be able to get my queen cells going, I'm not sure. So I don't know what I'm going to do about it because I don't want to go through all the motions and all the effort and build these cells that are or queens that are subpar because they're they're infected with a 
you know, a, a virus that could compromise their health. And I'm going to see that further down the line too, as we go. So you have to be using more of that Canadian rocket fuel. Um, looks like he froze up again. He, he looks actually presidential. <laughs> or, I'm going to, am I back? I'm going to slip on up to the house and get onto the other. I'm going to kick the kids off the other one and get onto that feed. And that maybe, maybe it'll work there. Uh, okay. I'm on the farm feed right now. I'm sorry about that game. No, it's, it's not a problem. We're not going anywhere. Um, I actually got to get to some questions. So we're going to hit those real quick. All right, Chris, hit us with some questions. All right. Hi from Northern Ireland. My hive is a little bit of chalk brood. Will my bees sort this out? JD's. Thanks for coming from uh, all the way from Ireland, JD. Bob, what's your thoughts on chalk brood? Well, there have been times in the distant past when I had quite a bit of it, and I it came to what I really figured out in my situation, that is it came down to where I was buying my queens from. I could see it just very distinct in one group of queens that had come out of a, uh, some, I won't name names, but a fellow out of South Georgia, they just came down with it right and left. Did the chalk brood come with the queens or was it just genetics that were more susceptible? I'm not sure, but uh, the bees were running now. I, I haven't seen it in a decade and a half and I didn't do anything to get rid of it. I, I, I'm being very vague. I'm, I, I, I apologize, JD's bees, but, um, I don't have you're a not, good answer, really. Well, you're, I don't think you're you're quite wrong either, Bob. Um, most of the guys that I know um, who fix chalk brood, almost all of them did it through genetic means. Yeah. Um, and uh, you would typically, when you hear of chalk brood, a lot of times you think of cool, rainy weather, poor conditions, stressful conditions. Yeah, Ireland. Um, <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> yeah. So Ireland's probably more prone to those uh, pressures than maybe some other places like New Mexico. However, uh, a friend of mine who was in uh, lives in Hawaii and, and runs quite a few bees was having some issues in, in, in some of his yards. The problem is on the Big Island, it can be uh, difficult to get diverse genetics because you can ship bees out to the mainland, but you're not supposed to ship them uh, back over because they're trying to keep stuff off the island. So there's sometimes genetic bottlenecks. And so he actually uh, brought in um, some drone semen from some more hygienic queens because you can bring that in and had uh, someone come and do a lot of AI stuff. And that seemed to really, really help and clear that out. I'm um, just doing some genetic stuff. And he was doing probiotics and doing all kinds of different things to try to clean it up. Just wasn't working. Um, so well, I've read a little research that... Uh suggests that probiotics can be helpful uh, well there's Corey. Hey, Corey. <laughs> uh, yeah. hello everyone uh, hello. well this is Corey stevens so we got a, another surprise guest we're going to bring him on for just a little bit and i'm kind of waiting for ian to get back Corey, so we can kind of continue the queen discussion but meanwhile let's just knock out some questions um, Bob, what do you think about thymol for chalk brood? I know that that's been talked about in the past as being helped to flush some things out, but I, I don't know if you've heard anything about that. Uh, just just rumors. I really don't know for sure. You know, I use a lot of thymol. I use apicard like you do at times. Is that why I haven't seen chalk brood for so long? Maybe, but uh, I don't know for sure. I really don't. I think... Um, it, it, uh, it may or may not help. Of course, in Ireland, they produce the Hive Alive product, which has thymol as one of the main ingredients mm. in there. So um, sorry we can't be more helpful, J.D., but thanks for coming on. Thanks for your question. And if you find a solution to your problem, please share that with me. Uh, we're always trying to learn something new. Um, hey, Bob, so you're from Oregon, right? So we're at in Oregon, Roseburg here, 43 years, Chris Wright. I was south of Roseburg in a small town called Rogue River, uh, which is just south of Grants Pass, kind of between Grants Pass and Medford. That He'll know what that means. Ro Rogue Valley. Yeah. I've only been to Oregon once, and uh, I was there as a groomsman for a wedding. And it was the, the coolest part of the entire thing was the church that they got married in. There was a tree that had bees in it. <sighs> and, I mean, I, I spent like two days just going – 
logistically, how can I make? No, no, I got to get up these all the way back to Tennessee, and I'm flying <laughs> on an airplane. But um, it was a lot of fun, and it was amazing how many hundreds of people went by those things and never even knew they were there. Mm -hmm. But it, they were about 15 feet off the ground. So Ian Stepler's back. Oh, you uh, got the I, expert here now. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Now you can ask your queen questions. Okay, ask the queen <laughs> questions. So we're going to try to bounce back and forth between some uh, specific topics and then getting back to uh, questions. We got a lot on queen rearing. So uh, let's focus on queen rearing questions for now, Chris, and then we will go into general questions later. So Corey Stevens is with us. He um, does AI work um, with um, bees that are of uh, resistant hy hygienic and all that kind of stuff um, new lines of vsh all that jazz it, trust me i know that sounds impressive but he's just an average guy um yeah. <laughs> i am um, from missouri after all that's right he's he's, he's from missouri and uh, but I did have a uh, good results with your queens, and I have a lot of people constantly asking me, Cayman, Cayman, what about the Corey Stevens queens? And you know, begrudgingly, I have to say, yeah, they're 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 working out great. Um, <laughs> good. You know, that's, that's, they they are though that they are laying really good patterns. They don't remind me of the VSH that we tried back in the day that just pulled everything. Um, they uh, they would just pull brood and pull brood and pull brood and just weren't super productive. Um, the AI queen that you um, did f for me, um, that one has been just, it's just been a constant struggle to keep them from swarming. They just keep, she just keeps laying. So for an AI queen, I'm actually surprised she's laying as hard as she is. I try to keep her down to about three frames of brood. Um, Good idea. That's but, a common problem with them. I've, a lot of times, you know, I'll have two deeps just because I want to let them run for a while and not keep up with them. And a lot of times they'll have two deeps with two or three honey supers on top. You know, so if they're done right, they function just like a normal queen. But there can be a lot that can go wrong where they don't do that. So, Well, yeah, I, I talked to a commercial guy uh, that I know that runs 15,000 hives. And uh, he actually went away from buying AI'd queens because he's like, I never could get one to last more than about a month and a half to two months. And it just wasn't really worth the, the dollars I was dropping per queen. Well, that, that's what he said. So when I when this one's been doing this for me, I'm like, well, either Corey did something really, really good or that guy's just got a source that's really, really bad. <laughs> or they could be using, some people call them SBIs or single drone inseminations, where they have a super narrow set of genetics, which is good in some ways and really bad in others. And it could be some of those that he's using because those things are terrible to keep alive. They just they, they want to supersede them. You know, if you got a season out of them, you're you're lucky. But you know, good AI, I mean, you can get multiple years out of her if you're lucky. I mean, stuff happens. It's like production queens. You know, I think what would you say, Bob? Like 18 months or so. Yeah, yeah. if you're lucky. Yeah. Well, it's the yeah. same. Those, I just, you know. I just hope, I just count and hope on a year, and if they last two, then I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Let's see. We, we had, uh, let's see, we're out of AI queens right at the moment. Um, uh, Shabu's doing a few for me right now. They should be here in a few weeks, and right now we're actually grafting from some of our queens just straight out of our outfit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the last one lasted uh, uh, one year, actually, exactly one year. All and, right. Oh, sorry, Bob. Go ahead. I was going to say, and Shibu is good at it. There's nothing, you know, he's, he knows what he's doing. He's very precise. Yeah, that video you did with him, I really liked it. And he had contacted me prior to that, but I didn't know him from yeah. Adam. And we had emailed back and forth just because I'll, you know, talk with anybody about bees. And then that came out, and that just ma made me get to know him even better. We've since hung out in person multiple times, but yeah. that was a great video. So, so the more you get to know him, the more you'll appreciate him. He's a really nice guy. Agreed. <laughs> so uh, we've got a, a lot of comments and questions to get to around queen rearing. So here's one right here. Gary B's, why are some queen cells colored suspiciously dark on the bottom? And I'm just going to say that we were talking about this earlier. Um, it's not necessary, but if it's a suspicious one, then as the queens go through their metamorphosis, they spin their cocoon. And that's kind of like rebar for the structure of the cell and makes them a lot tougher. And uh, 
So if you wait till like day nine, day you know, definitely the the longer the tougher I think they get, and uh, you can open them up and look down into them. Corey, you want to talk about that just a sec? Yeah, that's. I love the discussion you guys are having earlier. I was, I w- felt like commenting more, but I didn't. But just you were talking about cell size and everything, and it's completely variable. And I really agree with what Ian said too. But as far as the darkening of the cell, you know, some of them, like Ian was talking about black queen cell virus, if the larva just shrivels down or it's all nasty goo inside, you know. Um, the tips will be really dark. So some of them could be dead. But on the same side, where I, maybe Cayman was going, is if they're really close to emerging, you know how the bees will shave the wax off the end of them? And yeah. those are darkened. So I don't know what they're talking about specifically, dark on the bottom, but it could be they're dead or it could be they're about to emerge and the bees have just exposed that cocoon, that uh, the rebar that Cayman was talking about one one exception um that i've seen um is like if we have some really old combs like and we don't have a lot of these but if you put your cells as they're developing in between two very dark combs or if you have it in there somewhere in the hive and it's it's an old comb and you're getting them to clean it up sometimes they'll repurpose that wax and uh you'll end up with some darker um, queen cells because of that. So you, typically, I have very young combs in my starter finishers. I'll end up with those nice whitish yellow uh, looking cells. But if I have some old combs, I mean, they can look quite dark brown. I didn't know that too. I, you just taught me something there because I've wondered. Because if you pull, if you have a bunch of cell builders set up and you pull cells out of all of them, they look different. Some draw them longer. Some the wax is white. Some the wax is darker. You know, it's just, it's all over the place. It's almost like they're, I think Bob touched on this, their genetics, where he said the Italians will make bigger cells and stuff. There's just some bees that are like their cell builders are more cooperative. And like the cell size and shape is variable too. I think it's all, it does have a genetic component. But then again, you know, Cayman mentioned something I hadn't even thought of, of repurposing older brood wax. So that's, I'm going to pay attention to that now. It's pretty interesting stuff. So we got several questions for some individuals. Um, here's a, we'll, we'll get to that one in just a second. Here's one from James Seedler. Uh, Bob, when is the flow over in South Georgia? Uh, well, South Georgia is a pretty big place in areas. <laughs> it's still going right now. Gallberry is blooming. And uh, once the gallberry is over, it's kind of, that's kind of the end of it. Um, some years that can go till, you know, the third week in May, which we're just starting now. I just talked to a couple of big beekeepers down there in the last couple of days, and they're still making honey on gallberry. And then, it, and then of course, after that, you can get red bay and saw palmetto, so that can stretch it out longer, too. Saw palmetto is, is probably the latest thing in South Georgia. So Russell Koopman has a question for Ian. Ian, could you use the packages for grafting? And I've got a question that kind of goes a little bit further than that, Ian. Um, I saw you shaking those in. Those were oddly shaped. Um, do you mind talking about that a little bit, um, plus answering Russell's question? Yeah, and I'm just going to use this to get back onto what I was talking about earlier, about mm-hmm. black cell queen virus. Uh, Corey, I'm going to throw the ball into your court or even Bob too, maybe you it could fill or the 400 people here. Um, so I'm running into an issue this year with Nozema, high Nozema levels. I'm, my colonies have dwindled through the spring. Like it's been terrible. It's a terrible spring. They're rebounding now. They're starting to grow. I'm recovering, but through my testing, it's showing because the, I'm assuming because of the high nosema, I have just extraordinary high black cell queen virus residing within my analysis. And I'm, I'm just kind of putting the pieces together now thinking, well, with all this black cell queen virus, I'm probably going to see more incidents of black cell queen virus showing up in my cells if I, as I try to do some queen rearing here with the bees that are infected with it. So um, before I get on to, you know, maybe using the bees from my packages because that's a really good idea it's going to make a very expensive builder (laughs) but um, what would i be able to do with my bees to be able to clean up the black cell queen virus aside from just the you know putting in 
a honeycomb to keep the wax clean, the viruses and the bees, is treating the builders with uh, fumigillin to clean up the nosema. Is that going to be enough to be able to relieve that black cell queen virus issue? Or is that just going to linger and cause me problems for the next, you know, I, I do a little bit of reading of black cell queen virus and you can have outright death right off the start or you can have lingering health issues further down the line. Mm -hmm. And it's that part that I'm scared of, right? Dead right off the start, at least I know that, you know, they're out. But if, if it co if compromises their health and their quality, so I'm seeing this uh, decrease in um, vigor because of that further down the line, I, have, I don't want anything to do with that. So do you have any experience or any kind of feedback or thoughts in regards to black cell queen virus? Well, I think a lot of it's nutritionally based, which makes sense that you're seeing it because they're having nosema issues and nosema is going to affect their nutrition uptake because it's basically their guts are infected. So I don't know about the fumagil. If the fumagil effectively deals with it, I think it would get rid of a lot of those problems as well as nutrition. So whenever your flow really kicks in, I think some of that stuff's going to go away, you know, and Bob or somebody that has better experience maybe with thymol or fumagil maybe if you can expect that nosema to get cleaned up and your nutrition improves i think a lot of that's going to go away but and bob could speak to more about that but i can just say even i'm not having nosema issues but you can tell from week to week like our our spring here has been so unpredictable everyone was saying it was going early and so it starts to take off queens look great take is great drops off for a week, robbing, take goes to crap. You start having more culls, more viral or bacterial issues. Because like Cayman says, I open all of mine up. Like I am, do not take a conventional approach. I want to see every single one of them before they leave. And occasionally stuff happens, you know. But uh, anyway, so just nutritionally related from week to week, you can see a difference in queen cells. And that's why Cayman's look so nice and big is because he'll tell you probably there's a flow on, he's feeding them really well. And they're, they're not nosy. There were, there was too many bees in there. Yeah. There, there was Canadian rocket fuel plus a good pollen fuel uh, flow. Um, there was everything going everything. right for yeah. those cells i mean so you, you can't ask for more than that um, um and some people are like well, why'd you bother even feeding a pollen patty well because things can go wrong <laughs> uh and uh, just like throw it in there i like uh, the overbuild too well ian somebody's asking about teramycin and it may not be a bad idea i don't know what your yeah so what would that be exactly targeting then i, I understand the fumagillin because that antibiotic is targeting the nosema right and you're making a link between malnutrition and black cell queen virus which is very interesting and well, that's, that's just assuming and it is exactly like black cell queen virus because occasionally there's bacterial issues too so the thing with with teramycin would be if it is truly black queen cell virus it may do nothing because you know antibiotics don't attack viruses no. so Bob, do you have any comments on the fumagil or uh or fumadil and uh oh gosh uh teramycin uh not on fumagil and because i've never used it i i the last time i saw something that i thought might be a nosema problem i was living in oregon almost 40 years ago since moving to georgia i've you know, I don't use a microscope like Ian does, but I've just seen no reason to think that I had it at all. So I've, I've never bothered. Um, he, he's it's such a detriment there. He, he, his bees can't get out and defecate, and that that's, and that's, that's the problem. problem. Yeah. So here in Georgia, you know, it's just not a problem. You too, Ian, or I mean, uh, Cayman, you don't have that problem. Corey might have a little bit of it. I mean, they still, you know, will hit sub-zero temperatures. We're, I'm talking Fahrenheit here. Sorry, Ian. My, my brain does not convert Celsius. But, I mean, they can still get out in January off that time. Yeah. So they're not six months confined or four months even. You know, I, I, would, I, I would like to talk about teramias in just a minute. I'm, I'm in, in the middle of getting really educated on something that I think is brewing right now. I've got a new friend. Actually, I've known him for three or four years. Is Jorg. I can't pronounce his last name or remember it properly. He's in 
charge of the veterinary um, uh, thing over at the University of Georgia. Very, very smart man. And we've been talking about teramycin and European fowl brood and things like that a lot lately. I am absolutely convinced that there is a storm brewing on the horizon that very few beekeepers know anything about. He's finding bacteria that is resistant to everything, literally. Phylosin, lectomycin, teramycin, and he's seen samples that have so much uh, bacteria in it, he, off the charts, stuff he's never seen before. And I've talked to several beekeepers in Florida and middle Georgia who are suddenly dealing with a lot of European fowl brood and they're having to just pour the teramycin in or phylosin in or whatever. A friend of mine in Florida is using lectomycin now because teramycin doesn't work anymore. I think I think we got a serious storm brewing and people have no idea it's coming. Hmm. And Jorg believes the answer comes down to nutrition and probiotics. And I listened to a lecture by a pretty smart lady in North Carolina last year, and her research showed that uh, probiotics seem to have very little, if no effect. Her opinion was that it was a waste of money unless the bees are compromised somehow. And of course, compromise means, you know, pesticide exposure, fungicide, whatever. And Jorg and I have been talking about this idea that, you know, beeswax is loaded with chemicals and our bees are compromised in a way that we don't understand. And uh, I think we got a toxic soup going on. And anyway, I'm, I hope to put a video out with Jorg. I want to go over to Athens, Georgia and interview him on camera. He's very smart. See if I can get some. I can't talk about it intelligently enough to explain all this stuff, but he certainly can. And I'm going to try to get him to explain to us and, you know, put it out on YouTube, make people understand a little more about this antibiotic situation. It's dangerous. In the long term, it's not an answer. Uh, his opinion, and I agree with him, is that we're headed for troubled waters. Mm. Well, the reason I didn't use it is because, I, you know, it, most people put it in syrup or in a, a yeah. candy mm. of some kind. And the thing is, is it's mobile. And a lot of my stuff I split to the four winds after I've raised queens out of it. And so I don't know where it goes. You know, yeah. like, I can't keep track of it. And that bothered me. So I, I never, never messed with it, but. I don't remember the last time I've used the stuff myself. We, we just have a surveillance program and we try to call our combs, but I have, it's been a, a long time since I, I've used it. Well, you know. I, I, I try I, to keep my nest, or sorry, Bob, I stepped on you. No, it's okay. Uh, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I get a lot, I've been, I, like I put this, like on YouTube, I show everything I do and people ask why mm -hmm. I do that. But um, so I'm bringing these packages in to replace some of my dead stock. And they're, why are you buying packages? Why aren't you buying nukes? You know, nukes, nukes, nukes. And well, my answer to those people is something that they don't like to hear. And that's, I'm having a hard enough time keeping my own comb clean and managing the issues with it. I don't want to bring somebody else's issues into my operation also and have to then mix that into the whole bunch. So I'm bringing in bees, which I feel uh, I can manage those types of issues better because it's just yeah. bees, right? They come in half starved for one thing. So everything's purged. You dump them into my box, which I'm not doing a good enough job cleaning my comb anyways, but at least I know what's going on in that comb. I dump them in that box and have them get going again. Uh, just trying to, I, I believe there's a lot of issues with trading of comb. Yeah. Mother nature doesn't sure. do it. Mother nature destroys it with the wax moth, right? And they just yeah. cast off the bees. So that's one of the reasons why I brought in the packages for that. And I don't know. That, so that was just a passing comment on what you guys are saying there. I, got you. I was going to hit on teramycin a little and say I was guilty as anybody of, you know, when I went to work for that commercial beekeeper in Oregon in 81, every commercial beekeeper in the West gave two treatments of teramycin in the spring and two in the fall. That's what I was taught. And it worked. Honestly, if you didn't do it, you'd come down with American fowl brood pretty easily in those days. Don't, I haven't seen it in decades, but back then I saw plenty of it. And if you didn't use teramycin, you would come down with it from being exposed to other beekeepers. And, you know, it was, wasn't that many years ago, you know, when I stopped doing that. So, uh, 
uh, I was just as guilty as anybody of using too many antibiotics. So in my builder, what would we be using that in my builders for uh, to relieve the black cell queen virus? I'm, I'm not seeing what the connection is on that one. Yeah. It's, there was another breeder that told me that same thing, you know, because I, I open up everything. So I see every cull and that's why I open everything up now. And like, I, I like to use cells occasionally too, like Cayman. I just don't trust them. We've had a bunch, a couple hundred queens hatch out today. Jamie's behind me here cleaning up the mess. But we had several that looked like Cayman cells, well-fed, large, and dead. They didn't. They weren't as good as Cayman. And, and, and I mean, mine were. Mine were viable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's why I look in. I mean, that's out of hundreds of cells. You know, we've been grafted. We grafted about a little over 400 last week. So we're we're going through a lot. Mm. But you that's will awesome. find some. And I liked Ian's answer earlier about consistency too. Because if I see one that's abnormally long, you know, a lot of people are like, ooh, and gravitate towards it. <laughs> Oftentimes it's dead. It's like a slip larvae or yes. there's something wrong with them. So exceptionally overly large cells are a big red flag to me just as much as the, the tiny ones. Because we had a builder that threw a bunch of little tiny ones. And I don't know what was wrong with her. Same thing. Tara Myosin may have taken care of that because it wasn't black queen cell virus. And it was, I think it was bacterial or it comes down to nutrition. And, and Bob echoed that too, you know, with his friend from, from Athens, Georgia there. If the nutrition's there and you've got the flow, that's why I pay attention too to when the flow is on. If it stops, I just quit. Because once that nutrition drops off, your quality is not as good. Your queens aren't as good. And your take won't be as good either. So yeah. we got a question here um, from Loma Vista Bee Company. On my last round of queens, I had one hatch a day early. The version stung some of the cells and not some of the others by the time I got to it. My question is, will a virgin sting the most viable queens first? You know, I don't, <laughs> don't know, but, uh, you know, the other, the most viable queens that are, fixing to emerge if they are old enough to be piping and be making a sound through the cell that could encourage that virgin to go hunt them down just because of the sound that they're making but i don't know if anyone has a an answer to that one or not i definitely i don't um, they were trash talking that's what got them killed just wait till i come out of this cell <laughs> I take a lot of pleasure in killing virgins, rogue virgins that destroy my builders. It's yep. like, I found you, bitch. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I actually found a yellow dot queen in one of my, was it Monday? It was Monday. I was going through them. I'm like, man, this take was terrible. First frame I pulled out to look for emergency cells, there's a big yellow dot queen on it. And the only thing that I can figure is, I had somebody send me F1 daughters that did really well out of one of my breeders. And I had nukes about 20 yards away. Cause I clip, if I mark a queen, I clip her too. And this one, it wasn't the same yellow as mine. I think it was Ryan. It's Ryan, if you're listening, I think your queen cost me hundreds and probably a couple thousand. <laughs> <laughs> she somehow got from that nuke into one of my big queenless cell builders. So you know, I want to, there's a lot of weird stuff like that that happens in the bee yard. I'm just uh, weird stuff. Um, there's times of the year where I know that I'm not raising any queens, um, like in that yard where I'll be raising queen cells in the, the starter finisher, but I won't have any mating nukes. There shouldn't be any virgins that I've created flying around, but yet I'll have a rogue virgin just fly into my starter finisher and just take over. And, uh, we know that Africanized bees will do that um, with a, even a, a little pocket swarm. They'll just go into a colony, supersede the queen, and before too long you have Africanized bees. Thank goodness uh, we don't have any of that excitement up here in, in Tennessee. Um, but I have friends that deal with that in the south, and, uh, well, I'm glad it's their problem and not mine. So I want to say a big thank you to Yasmin. Um, thank you so much for coming on, um, and it was good seeing you in January, and thanks for supporting us the last few years. I want to say big thanks to Matt Kirkland out of Texas. Um, he says, got all the heavy hitters on tonight. Well, we, we just brought Corey in, so now we got a pinch hitter too. Um, <laughs> and uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, I just got to. I just can't help it. Mickey's Bees, okay. thank you, you so much. He's got a question for Corey. Corey, I checked 18 of my mated virgins, found two colonies that had zero mites and 300 open cells. Would you consider that a four on the Harbo score? None have been treated since I purchased. They were mated 11 months ago. Yeah, I would say so <clears throat> because, I mean, even if you if you score it, basically, if you look at Harbo score chart, it's zero and 200 bees. So, yeah, that's definitely would be a four, especially and that's the thing is as long as it's got a mite load or had mite load exposure, that should be an accurate score. You know, I trust John. He's got a he's got a Ph.D. and a lot of experience I don't have. You know, I just go with what he says. But if you're going with what Harbo says. That would be, definitely be a four. So why don't we go around with this question right here? This one's from Honey in the Coop. Sorry, Chris Maderas. Um, he's, and I want to say a big thanks to Chris. He's the guy doing all the stuff behind the scenes. He makes a lot of this stuff happen and does a ton of work for Hive Life. So we owe Chris a lot. But uh, anyways, I, I go off script a lot, and, and Chris puts up with me. Um, so what's the best way, guys, to introduce mated queens? I have 10 coming from Nature's Image Farm. And there's a lot of different ways to go about that. So, Bob, why don't you go first, and then we'll work our way around. Well, I, I'm, I'm guessing Corey's going to say the same thing. A push-in cage is probably the best way to get a very valuable queen introduced. And then also the concept that young bees accept uh, new queens much more readily than old bees. So if there's some way you can lose your old bees, that's helpful too. A nectar flow helps. Or feeding in such a way that you're creating... You know, you're emulating a nectar flow, but you got to be so careful not to cause robbing because that's the exact opposite. Those three, three things can almost guarantee acceptance, you know, a little bit of a nectar flow, a push-in cage and young bees, and you're just almost guaranteed to get it done. Push-in cage, meaning we make our own out of eighth-inch hardware cloth. You can purchase them in the catalogs, but I've honestly never seen one that's as good as a simple homemade model out of eighth inch hardware cloth and um uh, corey i'm sure you must use a lot of push-in gauges i do yeah and the same thing with you is i had some that were really i thought they were cool designed but they just had four little pegs you know yeah. to hold it you gotta shove it we use plastic foundation i have to shove it all the way down and even mm -hmm. then sometimes <clears throat> all under them but it seems like after they've tunneled under they accept her like, I don't know, something about her walking around on that comb. I, mean, I, don't, I don't like those cages at all. Well, if you are if you don't like those cages, because it is a little bit more work, but we do make our own out of one eight hardware cloth, too, just like Bob said. He hit well, I, I like I like the, the cage concept, but I don't like the ones that you purchase. Like, if you make the eighth-inch hardware cloth, um, <clears> ones, <throat> they, they work great. Um, but the ones that I've purchased... Um, always seem to get i get tunneling under them or i will get um they'll break on me they're just it seems like the plastic is pretty easy to for me to snap you know it's 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 probably laurel she you know she's just you know so rough on everything well if you don't use a push-in cage you know if i'm just using a standard you know, like a benton three hole or even the jay-z bz if i get one i'll just make a split and put a mated queen in it and just uh, some people candy release them then, but I kind of like to know for sure. So I'll leave it capped, you know, three or four days, then I'll go back. And mated queens are easier because they have that pro pheromone profile that suppresses everyone's ovaries and suppresses their urge to make queen cells. That's where cells and virgins are difficult at times because they don't have that uh, suppression effect. But even with a mated queen, sometimes... You know, if you just candy release them, um, they'll murder them. But it seems like, well, I have one instance. One of my friends, he was at Hive Life. You may have, you know if you met him or not, came in. They run a couple thousand colonies. And he manually releases them, too, just to make sure nobody's kicking her butt. So, you know, whenever he turns them loose, so he that, waits. Sorry, that, that, that goes right into to something that Ian talked about. I'm sorry to cut you off there, Corey, but... So manually releasing. I know that one time Ian was commenting on Bee Source. This is this goes back um, about you uh, manually releasing them because queens were so expensive. It was worth it to uh, take the time to uh, release them by hand. Are you do you still do that? Um, 
Boy, yeah, the bees, they humble me all the time. I have no idea what's going on most of the time. So uh, it's just ridiculous. If someone, everybody asks me all the time this a question like this, and I don't know how to answer it because uh, it just doesn't work whichever way you do it. I mean, it does work and it doesn't work all at the same time. And you're left there scratching your head, what the heck's going on? Uh, one of the biggest problems I have, or to get back to what you're saying, Cayman, yeah, that's what I do. Um, I uh, put the cages in and either I come back in two and a half days and pop the cork lady, meet the candy, or I, I release them in about four days and it seems to work very well. But that's not the problem I have. The problem I typically have is uh, emergency cells being built uh, mm -hmm. within the nuke that we're building, regardless when, it, like, you can understand the emergency cells be built uh, if you leave that nuke for, you know, a, a, a while while being queenless. So of course, they're going to start making them. So then you got to take care of them. Whether you make them uh, up and you put a queen in there right away, they shouldn't be making the emergency cells. Um, am I just, you know, not knowing what's going on? Or do you guys go through and hunt these emergency cells as you're trying to introduce or, or what's yeah. going on? That, that's where I was going with that one story is he put it in there, went back to turn it loose. They were trying to kill her. They made cells. He held it again. They made a couple crappier ones, still wanted to kill her. Now, nobody's going to go through this much work unless you really want to save a queen. The third time he went back, they had nothing to make a queen cell out of, and he manually released them. And they're like, oh, we're happy to see you this time. So it yeah. changed. But those cells, that's where I learned the hard way with breeders. And with virgins, that's how I figured out the virgin intro thing. Is I, I was trying to explain it to Bob. I think he thought I was a nutcase at Missouri State. <laughs> I, I hold them until like seven days from when a split is, but I leave her in there. And if you take all those queen cells out, this is with a virgin. You could do it with a mated queen, but I don't think you'd want to hold her that long. Unless they are making cells, you would have to hold it seven days, six at the earliest, cut all the cells and then their, their attitude towards her should change. But that's where I figured out the virgin intro thing. Cause a lot of times I just want to reject the heck out of them because they make cells just like some of the native queens you were talking about. Well, they would still feed her most of the time, but if I would wait seven days and cut all those and then candy release them, even you don't even have to manually release them. The take would go so much higher, but that's their only option. They have nothing, <clears throat> to make a queen cell out of but that's a most people don't wait seven days and come back you know so anyway yeah that's a lot yeah I, listening to you talk about that and we've talked a few times about it too and you're almost starting to convince me to maybe do something like that but that's a lot of work too right then you're going work. through like, like right now we're requeening some colonies and i'm just pinching off the old one putting the, the new one in there and gonna come back and just pop it open hopefully everything works but there's inevitably there's going to be emergency cells and some of those coming through so that's kind of why i shifted off not why that's not the reason why but one of those many reasons why i quit using uh, mated queens coming in because i was spending a lot of money and i wasn't I felt like I was seeing a lot of compromise there or casualties there. So then I started making my own cells and, and virgin <laughs> solves all problems, right? You put a virgin oh. cell in there and she's, she'll kill all those emergency cells. And it, it's, everything's just seemed to work a lot better when I was, when I shifted into uh, dropping queen cells in instead of mated queens. Do you How think much? Queen quality? Uh, do you think it, because it seems like your method's spot on. Do you think it Yeah. Works? That might be it too, and that's another reason too. Maybe there's a bad batch of queens that comes through that gets damaged in shipping. There's a lot of problems that happen between the beekeeper who do an they do absolutely spectacular work, and they can talk circles around what we're talking about here. Just 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 such high quality, but what they're doing and what I'm getting isn't the same thing so something in between is happening i think and you get good ones come through through and you get bad ones that come through and i think it's a transport yeah so yeah. i think i yeah. think uh the best queen is the one that never sees a cage um oh, yeah. that's that's just my opinion on that i mean if, if you're going for like over a thousand queen average or a hundred queen average you know uh, you can get some really good queens in cages but the problem of it is i don't know what they're in canada i'm sure they're not cheap uh but if you order 100 queens 
and you lose 10 of them due to random things. Maybe they decide to raise a virgin or whatever. Maybe shipping uh, was rough on a couple of them. And, you know, you pay 40 Canadian dollars or whatever it is, 30 Canadian dollars, whatever. And uh, for that queen, you lose 10 of them, and that hurts. But if you lose 10 queen cells that you made yourself, well, that doesn't hurt quite so much. And yeah, uh, that's just it. Bob, what do you do when you make your nukes and you're for sale? You put a mated queen in there. Are you following through in five days to disturb that nest to cut down those emergencies or do you even have trouble with that uh, no we don't do anything uh, one thing we might do uh, some of the time is we'll put a piece of masking tape over the candy and then punch a very very small hole in the masking tape like something like the end of a frame nail or something and that'll buy you another day maybe I, you know I, i've never gone back to see just how long it takes them to chew through the masking tape, but it's obvious that it takes them a while because in, in a compromised situation, we always have better luck when we do that. It buys you a little more time. And uh, you, you, oddly enough, you need to use the cheapest masking tape you can find, the good yeah. stuff, the blue painter's tape. They don't chew through it. They don't go through it. And the reason you have to poke a hole in it is so the bees realize their sugar candy on the other side because if you cover it with just masking tape, Without a hole, sometimes they don't chew through it at all. You come back two weeks later and it's still covered with masking tape. And uh, I found over the years that that can help quite a bit, actually, in that masking tape trip. Hmm. You know, it's, it's nice to know that other people are struggling with different issues um, throughout the year. I know because uh, Queens is one of those things that constantly makes me scratch my head and, and, and also getting splits to uh, work out and I look at it as a kind of a, a certain degree a percentage game. So getting to some of the questions, Cameron Martin, I want to say big thanks. Um, I'll get to the Wildwoods next. Um, Cameron Martin, um, thank you so much for your donation again. Um, actually, it's the other one. In my experience, that packages will draw come lots faster than nukes. Um, if you can get a, a clean package with a really good queen, they, they perform really well. I think the, in the Georgia and some of the packages that I've seen in the past, um, the, the bees typically are really clean. It's the, the queens, it's, you're rolling the dice on did you get a good one or not. And there's a lot of queen issues with packages um, that I've heard in this region this year. Um, Cameron Martin's uh, other question was, I raised my first queens and was one— was off one day and they started to hatch in my incubator. What do you th do if that happens? I had four of them die after putting them in queen cages. So um, that actually happened to me this year. Um, I actually messaged Corey and was like, uh, I've got some virgins uh, running around in my incubator. What do I do with these things? So uh, why don't you go first, Corey, and then the other guys can chime in if they want to. Well, you, you got to think about in nature, whenever they hatch, you know, there's immediately somebody to feed them or they could walk over and eat. So that's the main thing is if you're going to have them unattended, you want to have either a piece of candy in there or some honey or honey's they track all over the place. So just a drop of honey would be it. Basically, they need something to eat whenever they come out. And, you know, within... Within 48 hours, if you put them, if you get them out and you get them in a candy cage successfully, if you don't add attendance, even a virgin, within 48 hours in an incubator, it's like they just lose hope and die. They're, they're made to be in that social environment. So that'd be the first thing I would say is make sure you get them on some good candy immediately and have access to it. And then within 48 hours, either put them in a colony, use them, or add attendance. It's probably the way uh, Ian's kids are feeling right now as he's kicked them off of social media. Um, what are they going to do? Yeah, they go through uh, withdrawal. <laughs> I hear a lot of fighting in the kitchen right now. So right. <laughs> uh, would you guys have something to add to that question on uh, having queens uh, hop out uh, of a queen cell? I, I don't like fooling with virgins when I can help it. Uh, do you guys have anything to add to that one? I just never had any luck. Uh, yeah, I'm a student of Corey here, so maybe my uh, my whole thought process will change as maybe I get more familiar with maybe managing that way. But I just stay right away with it. I, I like to handle cells. Uh, I'm I'm the same way. Um, however, um, I, I did have those virgins emerge out. Um, it ended up being 20 of them out of the 
the cells that I had in the incubator. And you know what? I had really good takes out of them. I got them in within 24 hours. I dropped them into uh, nukes um, that were about three frames strong of bees. Um, and they only had um, young bees. They were moved to a different location, didn't really have a lot of foragers. And, uh, of course, but it's it's May. I mean, there's honey flow like crazy. I'm there. You, you accidentally drop a frame and just nectar falls out all over the place right now. So it's a lot easier to do a lot of things right now. But they accepted the queens uh, just fine in those uh, situations. Chris, why don't you give me another queen-rearing question? And, folks, we will get to general bee questions before too long. That was kind of the main topic of discussion. And we'll get to just uh, general bee questions before too long. It came in a Bob and Ian, and uh, I probably this one's before Corey came on. What queen rearing method do each of you prefer for raising queens? I'm using a starter uh, slash finisher right now, so I think there's a couple different methods represented in this chat. Bob, why don't you go first? Well, I guess what I do would be termed as a starter slash finisher, where we use the same colony. Of course, I learned that from Chris Werner, where we take a queen right double deep that's real strong and you know, uh, shake most of the bees in one box and isolate, isolate the queen above a double screen board and turn the bottom into a starter for two days. And then we'll come back uh, two days after putting the graphs in and reverse it and make it a queen right finisher. So it goes from a queenless starter with the queen up above to a queen right finisher. And uh, they do great. And I, I there, there's pros and cons to every single method and it really comes down to one thing. If you got a bunch of young queenless bees, they'll raise cells for you, no matter what you do. <laughs> well, um, that, that that summed up a lot of it right there. Um, I, I use a just starter finisher. Um, it's it's just a powerful single deep brood box. Um, it usually I'll put three frames of capped brood in there. I'll start it up. I'll come back two days later, and I will cut any cell. Um, that they have created, but I typically don't have a lot of opportunities for them to raise cells anyways. And I'll have two frames at least of good bee bread or more. I'll be feeding them. There'll be, if there's 10 frames of in that 10 frame box, and there will be, um, then I will have probably the equivalent of about 14 frames of nurse bees in that box. So it's just this massive colony, kind of like what Bob said, tons of young bees, swarm-like conditions, and, and that works really good for me. I learned that method from Michael Palmer, and it, it works well. Um, I've seen Bob's method in action at Chris Werner's place, and I've seen Bob's videos. That obviously works very good. And a friend of mine in Hawaii produces over 10,000 queens a year uh, using a different method um, that's slightly different. And... Uh, this this year, just real quick, uh, I, I found a colony that was wanting to swarm on me. I went in there, and I pulled the queen out, and I went ahead and made a small split. I took all of the, the larvae and eggs out that I could, and I turned that into a queen-rearing hive because they wanted to make cells. And they actually did phenomenal on, on making cells for me because they were so powerful, and they had the desire to build cells because they were in the swarm mode. And um, I got that from GM Doolittle, who, you know, kind of— taught us all about grafting queens back in the day. Um, Ian, what kind of system do you use? Yeah, I, I keep it really simple and then make it really complicated all at the same time. I just have like a queenless builder and I do everything in that queenless builder. I find the magic number of bees is 10 pounds of nurse bees in there that I just I fill it right up and I rotate my graft through That's every four days. Yeah, it's a lot of bees, but I need a lot of queens uh, churning out in a small amount of time. So I just you know, get this queenless builder going and, and then I just rotate the graft through there every four days just to keep her going. So that's what I do. Yeah. But, uh, of course, Ian's got some really good videos on that. Bob's got videos on his system. Um, Corey, have you got any videos on your system? Um, I've got one where I just kind of described how I find cell builders. You mentioned earlier finding one that was swarmy and using it. That's that's what I do is I just go through my big double deeps and usually crack a crack the top box and look look for queen cells. As soon as they start making queen cells, I just remove the queen out of it. You know, I'll move her to a nuke if I want to, if I want to keep her. 
and then uh, take any of the queen cells out, and then I'll do three rounds into that. So like the first week, they'll make some emergency cells sometimes, but usually I get a good take out of it. I'll, second week, I go back, take the cells out, and just graph, and the third week, I just switch graphs out, and then I'll requeen them. So basically, I'm just jumping around to where all my colonies are wanting to swarm. Those are cell builders. But it's similar to what you all are saying, just large a queenless starter finishers is basically what I'm using. Yeah, B age is important. What you just described, I used to do something like that. And I found after three rounds that uh, they weren't doing so great unless you were constantly putting in young bees or hatching brood. Maybe that's what Cayman's doing. I saw, I, I saw that you mentioned you got five rounds in a row. I was wondering if you were adding bees, Cayman, or brood or something to keep them oh, going. Yeah. Yeah, we will add uh, good frames of capped brood periodically. Um, it's those nice brick uh, frames that we'll find on a, on a colony. They're like, eh, they probably need pulled back a little bit. So we'll swipe that capped brood from them, and we'll plug those in periodically. And we'll also, after, usually by the third week, they're in a different location. Um, we'll, two, 14 days to 20 days, they'll stay in the same location uh, by the third week. Um, we will move them to a, a different location, and then we'll put a small nuke with a good queen there, and they'll get all the forager bees. and some, So they get a big boost, but we're also getting rid of some of those old bees, move them to a new spot so we can kind of see what do, how many young bees do we have um, that way. And, and it, you know, it's not the, probably the, the best way to do it, but uh, I've gotten several hundreds of queen cells that I've been very— happy of uh, with them i just sometimes i wish that they'd go and and get mated and come back a little bit more effectively that uh, 40 percent take kind of hurt my my ego there um on, the, on that one group so there was a, a question down here i used to purchase queens from ferguson apiary in canada they say the u.s will not allow them to ship to the states anymore anyone have any idea why so ian you want to talk about this tedious topic it's biosecurity. Yeah, I don't want to get too much into this. It, it leads to another conversation. But, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. That, nothing makes any sense to me. Sure. Well, um, you know, you're a farmer. Corey, have you been able to? Um, uh, have you? Have you got your? Or maybe I'm putting you in the spot in front of everybody. That's okay. Here. Yeah. That's okay. Are you? Uh, have you got your Africanized uh, testing back yet? No, no, I have not. But what you have to do is you have to have DNA samples from your breeders that say there's no African eyes. So I don't know where Ferguson's at. Maybe they're in a compromise zone where there's no, African they're, eyes. they're in Ontario. Yeah. And he can't cool. ship down to the States. We can't oh, ship okay. into the States. Yeah. I'll see what but, uh, from that, I, I'm just trying to deviate off that question because I don't want to get into exactly that, but it, yeah. Uh, um, have you been able, or, or repeat what you said, have you been able to pass that test? I haven't passed it yet, but I don't have any reservations about passing it. We just have to get, you know, it's going to Purdue University. We re reached out to Crispin and them in the lab, and uh, they told us, here's what you do, send them in, well, you know, in alcohol. We have to do it the same season. Yeah, we have to do it in the same season, is what Jamie's saying. Oh. Okay. And then you've also got to be in a blue zone. Like, have you seen those maps? Someone may have posted on your chat yeah. where it shows you're not in an Africanized zone. You're right on the edge of that, though, right? You're in the uh, right side of it? it. We're north of it a little bit. We're in a blue area, so we should be good there. Yeah. But it's a little bit further south. You know, I don't know if it was southwestern Arkansas or where it was at that they had some confirmed. But, mm -hmm. yeah, still... it shouldn't be an issue. I've just... We've been so busy here lately, and what I pre-sold, I was sold out on, so I was hoping to have extra capacity. But, you know, like I mentioned to you in our chat, I'm, I'm mainly looking at next year, too, whenever I yeah. don't have a day job as well. Um, I want to have all that tidied up, so, you know. So a here's a question down here from Pat Gooch. I'm setting up a five-frame starter finisher tomorrow afternoon. How long would you wait to introduce a graph? So five-frame starter is a video that we have um, on our YouTube channel, a couple videos, and it's similar to the process that I use for the 10 frame hive, which is what we use for our uh, making nukes and increased colonies. And, and really the only difference is it's half the size, so it's it's not as productive. Um, but it definitely works. If you're um, a, a small sideline or hobby beekeeper and you're wanting to get more control on either genetics or just have 
what I feel like is a better queen, because uh, I think you can raise really good queens in your own backyard, um, is use a five-frame nuke, and you don't have to have any brood in it. It can be um, one frame will be the graft frame, and then you'll have two frames of bee bread. I like to to have a comb if possible um, where they can take any incoming honey or sugar syrup and then you can have um, a frame that's foundation to where if they want to draw comb they're going to draw it on that foundation instead of drawing combs where your queen cells are that's called webbing and that's a real big pain in the rear end when all your queen cells are combed up and webbed together so um, what I would do Pat is I like to, the first day that I make these starters up, I will leave one frame of young larvae in. And so I don't graft the same day I used to do that, but my first round was never stellar, it seemed like. And so I would leave a frame of larvae in that five-frame nuke setup or a 10-frame queenless starter finisher. And then I would come back 24 to 48 hours later, pull that frame, and then put my grafts in. Because within 24 to 48 hours, they're going to take the larvae on that frame and start making royal jelly and making emergency queens. So they're already in that mindset, and it just I seem to get better takes with that. Anyone have anything to add to that? Well, most colonies wait at least eight hours to start emergency cells, uh, and they can take as long as 24 uh, we always make our cell builders up one day and graft into them the next day. So that fits along your your reasoning of 24 hours, and that works pretty good. That's a, that's a good point to make. I wasn't sure if there was any research behind that or not. I just noticed that my second takes were always superior, and I'd heard to talking to beekeepers that knew more than I did that a lot of times um, – if you put it in immediately, the, the takes aren't quite as good. So I'm just like, you know what, wait a day, let them kind of figure things out, and then give it to them. Um, let's get to a few more queen questions. This is an important one I wanted to address. Does the size of the queen matter? Are large queens better than average-sized queens? So take that one and run with it. I love the great big-ass queens because they don't get through the excluder. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Those little skinny bitches, they, they always cause <laughs> troubles. <laughs> Carrie, she just hates them. She, she'll she pinch off those skinny ones well, just because it causes grief. A, a practical reason. <laughs> the, the, the discrimination against the skinny queens. Um, but, uh, that, is, that is an interesting point. There always is, in, in the operation, a couple queens that are slender enough to get through that excluder. And uh, I'll, I'll go and look at four or five mediums, and I'm like, oh, man, I've got a lot of honey. I'm fixing to pull off of this one. And you pull two or three of them, and there's brood in them. And I'm like, doggone it, that queen slipped through the excluder. And sometimes you'll have a queen down below the excluder, and you'll have a daughter or a different virgin that's moved uh, her way up. But uh, getting kind of back to the quality, though, um, typically it's perceived that – bigger queens are better i think probably with queen cells there's a little bit of play there but uh, i do like those big queens that like to lay i think bob mentioned earlier didn't you about the ovary they have them having bigger ovaries and being able to lay more I, thought yeah. mentioned that. Yeah. I mean it seems to me like if they're physio physiologically bigger that they would have bigger ovaries and it seems like those just lay harder maybe it's my imagination no, I think you're. I think you're right. Just just casual observation, no real research on my part over the years. It seems like a reasonably good sized queen does better than the skinny ones, like Ian was uh, mentioning. You do see puny skinny queens doing a good job sometimes, but I think the overall average, if there was some way to measure it, I I think the the bigger queens average better. I think Randy Oliver did a trial on that, and he determined that is the better yeah. sized queens were the, the most prosperous. Yeah, I would go with that. Yeah. Well, and especially I think in areas where you have a very long brooding season, where you, your bees could be brooding eleven, even twelve months out of the year, um, I think it would be more critical maybe than anywhere um, to have queens that have larger spermathecas and ovaries because now we have the 
possibility of being able to have more, which means they can lay longer, um, probably. But eh, we marked uh, over 170 queens this year. I, uh, we were, you know, we sold some nukes and uh, had a uh, a bunch of folks wanting marked queens and I've never agreed to marking this many queens before and I never will again. Um, that was the gift. They were good size nukes too. I mean, so finding those queens in like a four and a half to five frames of bees was a, we, we totally were able to do it, but gosh. Um, however, there was, um, a, but after you grab them so many times by the thorax, that's, that's the way I grab mine to mark them. I'll just grab them by the wings with my right hand, and then I will um, take my left hand and get it around the thorax and mark it with my right hand. That's how I do it. And uh, But after doing that so many times, it was interesting. After a while, you could feel a diameter difference between some of those queens in that thorax areas. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there – I don't know what the difference was, but to the naked eye test and also you know, being able to feel it, I felt like some of those queens were a good 15 to 20 percent bigger, you know, uh, on the thorax diameter. It's just a significant feel difference. But anywho, um, moving well, on. To, go I, ahead. I can't help myself, Cayman. I just can't help myself. Do bigger people do a better job than small people? <laughs> well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. And uh, chat. That's right. Hey, um, I apologize, and then I say it. So there you go. That's, uh, that was a classic, Bob. I was still, the only thing that I regret is that it was not me saying it. Um, but uh, uh, yeah. the devil made me do it. You know how the devil. Went. <laughs> well. I, <laughs> I'll be the first one to admit that um, when it comes to a lot of things, being bigger is better. There are some things like when you're working underneath a truck on doing mechanical work, being shorter is kind of nice sometimes. And oh, yeah. especially when you're flying on an airplane, I'd rather be Cayman Reynolds, uh, Cayman Reynolds than uh, you know Ian Stepler on that airplane. It, 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 it sucks to be me on the airplane. I don't know how anyone bigger than me has to fool with that. It must really suck. Well, in your defense, I wouldn't say that to anybody else because I know you take it just fine. I kind of have it coming. Yeah, uh, yeah you do. You pick on King or you pick on Ian so much. You do have it coming. I do, you know, but uh, he's he's an easy target for a lot of reasons. And, and it's too expensive to come down here and beat me up. So I'm pretty safe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so th this goes all day long in my B crew. I really try to stay out of the fray because I don't want to be on the receiving end of this stuff. <laughs> John and Seth and those guys, it's endless. And uh, but every and, and they'll tell you every once in a while, just out of the blue, I've just got to put my two cents in. Yeah. Put my in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's really, I know they do in other parts of the world, um, but in the South, it seems like there's quite a bit of the, trash talk verbal warfare however you want to yeah. collar it and it's a sign of affection it really is so that means i really like ian that's uh, man that's really <laughs> that's embarrassing to say that is that another um, one of those bad jokes <laughs> <laughs> yes that's a bad joke um all right moving on to something serious <laughs> So Lucas Guile says, I've read multiple conflicting views on this. What's the general consensus on making autumn olive honey? I'm in PA and the bloom is over around me, but next year, would it be worth chasing? So I don't think they've got that up in Canada. Um, we've got it here in some places. Um, Bob, I'm pretty sure you have it around you. A little autumn bit, olive. a little bit, not a lot. It's a good flow for me where we have a lot of it um some areas in my county are very sparse or have none um, on the autumn olive bushes it's kind of got a habitat uh, a growth that's similar to privet in my opinion a similar height it grows in similar places and it's similar similarly invasive um but in a good year i'll get a super off of that stuff in my good yards wow for sure it's good honey isn't it i bought some out of uh Came out of Michigan. Uh, I said it was pretty much pure, and I, I thought it was pretty tasty. Actually, I liked it. I, I, if I could get 
autumn olive all throughout this county and twice as much, I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, I'm sure the extension agents would kill me if they found out I was trying to help that produce. Um, it's so um, good for pollinators, though. I mean, you look at everybody happy. There's bumblebees all over it. So, I mean, it, maybe it does spread a bit much, but it, you know, invasive has such a negative connotation that it's the bees would disagree with you, I would have to say. But that marks the swarming season. Well, they're invasive too, Corey. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, not. And, actually, and so, that's incorrect. I'm very dilute native. I'll clean on. Oh, I was talking about the bees, but <laughs> yeah, you're definitely an invasive too. Um, so Paul Martin, thanks so much for um, coming on and supporting us again, Paul. Hope you guys are having a good bee season. If you could only get one book on queen rearing, what one should I buy? Wow. What a great question. Um, okay, guys. Favorite GM queen rearing book. You mentioned it earlier. GM Doolittle. That's a great one to start with. Cla old classic. Bob, you're next. Queen Rain book. Uh, I'm going to pr probably show my ignorance here. I haven't read all the Queen Rearing books. In fact, I've only read a few. Um, and what was my, your favorite? What's that? What was your favorite? I, this is going to sound crazy. I guess it's because I knew him. Uh, Steve Tabor, Breeding Super Bees. I love that book. That is a good one. Yeah. That's on from a breeding perspective, too, not just... Yeah, he was he was sharp. Steve was a sharp guy. He was very smart, very colorful, uh, hard to be around sometimes because he had no filter. I mean, just he didn't insult anybody, just no problem. <laughs> I got along with him really well, though. So he, he was very smart, and I really liked that book. And he put a nice little uh, note in it for me when he gave it to me. And so awesome. maybe that's maybe I'm prejudiced. I don't know, but I think that's a cool book, Breeding Super Bees by Steve Tabor. I like, well, I, I haven't read everything of his, but uh, Larry Connor, he's, he has some good insight. Yeah. I think just to like to see his perspective on things. And <clears throat> is that yes. one of his? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. one of his. Yeah. Yeah. Rearing Essentials. Well, you know, a lot of people don't know just how much experience Larry Connor has. I mean, he's been at this a long time. He was part of the, uh, he was one of the last people that was involved with the uh, Starline. Yeah. In midnight uh, program, which most new beekeepers don't know what that is, but that was quite something. Oh yeah, yeah. So, sure. so Ian, you, you like this book right here? Um, yeah, it's it, a good book. It is a good book. Um, honestly, he's, he's got other ones out too. I forget where I see some of his. He talks about drones a lot, also. Uh, maybe yeah. his presentations. I'm thinking of. Uh, he probably mentions the books in his presentations. He's got yeah, a lot maybe. of information. He's got Queen uh, Sex Essentials too, or 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 B Sex Basically. Essential. Yeah. yeah, I've seen this one, but yeah. <laughs> and um, and that one is 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 a lot more advanced. This this one's really good. Don't get me wrong. There's some commercial aspects in here to a degree. Um, th this is a really good B book. Um, if you're wanting to raise a handful of queen cells, and and we really need to be getting some kickback from Wickwas from this promotion. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm just teasing. We're just trying to be helpful here. But this this is a good book, and this is the one that Corey was referring to, Scientific Queen Rearing by GM Doolittle. It's a reprint, but um, I really like it. It's it's a lot of its story as well, kind of how he you know he really needed to figure out a way to get uniform and better queens back then they didn't have the pests that we do now um but they did not have um i think a lot of people think they had better bees back then but actually they struggled with very unthrifty bees back then very aggressive bees and they were trying to get some uniformity in bees that were less swarmy and less runny and and just didn't have the quite the behavior a beekeeper would like to enjoy and so um, he wanted to be able to get his best queens and, and make and make a lot of them in mass, and they didn't have a method. So this kind of goes through his whole process of creating his own queen cells from wax, and 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 it, it's a fun book. But it's written in kind of old English, and and if you like to read, this is a fantastic read, I think. But uh, has anybody read uh, Roger Morris's book? He was at Cornell University. That was such a good book. Like it's it's vaguely in my memory. I haven't read that one. I read the one by um, what was it Jay Smith um, on queen rearing, but not the Roger Morse. The, Roger Morse is on a mead. I, I've seen a decent okay. bit of that one. I've never tried to make any of it, but um, 
that was a, that was a good question. I like books though. I'm a big book nerd. Um, Gus Mitchell, I haven't talked to him in a, a couple of weeks, but he's got a bigger book collection than I do, and I've got a pretty decent beekeeping book collection. So, um, you know, some of these questions are going way back, and don't overuse antibiotics. Um, we have, um, you know, t talked a lot on, on various things, and so a lot of you guys have questions that date back 45 minutes ago. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump down. Um, just big nerd is more accurate, Chris Medeiros. You turd. Um, so uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna jump on down more to the bottom. Any of you guys who we missed your questions earlier, um, resubmit them, please, and we will try to get to as many as we can. Let's let's just focus on general B questions now. Um, uh, one last thing, um, Corey. I told you I, I'd keep you on here for about twenty thirty minutes, and we've gone past that and. And you've, you've been awesome to be with, but we're going to try to tighten this up just a little bit more. But I, I do appreciate you coming on last second. Um, real quick, um, you know, Bruce, uh, Bees, he got some virgin queens from you. Um, mm -hmm. I've got queen cells from me. You're still selling bees right now. So if someone's looking for some queens, how, how would they get a hold of you and do all that? I'm just checking out my website, stevensbco.com. Um, last year... And what we've always done is just pre-sold queens. Like I know I'll produce this amount and then I just work through my orders. So mm -hmm. we're still working through that this year. We've still got some, but next year I think I'm just going to post live ready to ship inventory. So I may do that differently. But. So there, there's his website right there. And, and thanks so much, Corey, mm -hmm. for bringing a ton of insight to us on uh, all things queen rearing and VSH. And, and we've had you on here before and at the conference. And I'm sure this isn't the last we'll hear of the hillbilly VSH yeah. breeder. Hey, Corey, Corey, yeah. before you go, I'm going to see you in Louisiana in a couple of months. I want to have dinner with you. That sounds great. I'm That's looking so forward, to forward to it. Well. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming. We'll see you a little bit. All right. See ya. All right. So getting to uh, these uh, general beekeeping questions or specific ones for Bob or Ian. And holy smokes. Actually, smoke. Cayman, if you don't mind, I'm just going to hijack this just for a second. Hijack? I talk, yeah, I just want to talk to Bob just for a minute. Um, you have experience with building or putting together packages. I've seen some a video or two of you of you, you building package bees and that. Um, this spring, I've encountered a little bit of losses, and I've been buying packages in, but there isn't a lot of like I, they run a su supply. So I'm, I know a guy out in BC, 20 hours away, and he has a few extra colonies. And I said, "Well, how about you? If I bring the boxes over, will you shake the pack the bees in there to make up packages, and I'll drive back with them and make up some nukes back home here? Do you have made it?" queens and all that he's oh yeah that's pretty good but he has no experience at all whatsoever doing this i have no experience at all whatsoever doing this so i just thought i'd ask you a few questions in regards to uh kind of proceeding with this whole process and that yeah. with, with your um the the hives that you are going to take the bees from do you have any initial prep work that you do to those colonies before you shake those bees out or do you just walk cold to a yard pick the colonies and shake them well the only prep two two preps that we might do one is we might give them a light feeding which you know that's kind of a no-brainer for anything you're going to do we might put an excluder in four or five days ahead of time so we can find the queen a lot easier oh, yeah. and so not a lot of prep um one thing that i really learned uh that i think is real important that is mostly overlooked honestly by most package shakers and that is to pay, shake the packages when the bees are flying so that you're getting mostly younger bees i was looking at your package i've you know watched your video i don't comment on your videos a lot that doesn't mean i'm not watching um i watch a lot of them just and i was judge, wondering, just judging silently <laughs> well, i don't know what to say a lot you ian always comes back with these smart sharp little comments you know lol i don't even know how to do that <laughs> but uh, you need to shake the bees in the daytime when they're flying, and that's where a lot of these uh, shakers go wrong. Uh, they'll shake them. In Georgia, they like to shake them super early so they get them ready before it gets too hot or something. Nice. And they get out there at first light, and they're shaking packages before the bees are even flying well. 
and they get more older bees. And I was wondering these packages you were getting from, uh, you know, overseas, uh, uh, you know, those, maybe there was too many older bees and they weren't making the trip too good and younger bees might've done better. I was just wondering, you, I know you don't know the answer to that, but no. if you can get your friend to shake when the bees are flying, uh, that would be quite helpful. And then some shakers shake out of the supers and that's a mistake because you'd be surprised how many older bees are actually in a super. You wouldn't think so, but if you want to prove it to yourself, just blow bees out of your super and see how many find their way back home. It's a pretty large number. So shaking out of the supers is a mistake too. You want to st shake right out of the center of the brood nest, preferably when the bees are flying. Yeah, he has his colony set up in doubles. And yeah, I think he's going perfect. to do uh, what you mentioned there. Like it's going to be a double brood chamber and he's going to hunt the queen down, make sure she's below the excluder and then take everything up on top. What, how much? Well, no, let's back up a moment. What okay. you're best off to do is find the queen and isolator and shake right out of the center of the brood nest. That's where your best package will come from. Right off, right off the open brood. So from both boxes. Well, both boxes, but get as much as you can. You know, the older bees can revert back and feed brood if they have to. So if you can, I just, I just had the best luck if I could shake, shake the center of the brood nest heavily. You know, right the open brood, right, right where those young bees are. Get as much as that, as much of that as he will allow you to get. And you'll have better packages. So are you putting the queen underneath the excluder in the second, then you're shaking the top, just the center and the top? Then, well, the way I used to do it is we would find the queen and put her on whatever frames we wanted. Like if we wanted to leave six frames of bees or four frames of bees, we would put them in the bottom box and not necessarily brood and leave her in that bottom box. All the rest of the frames are stacked outside and we would shake them all. And we always tried to make sure there was a lot of open brood in those frames we were shaking, not just the honey frames in the upper box. That makes sense. I think it would. It makes a big difference from what I've observed. I, I've never shook packages myself, but I have uh, like my own packages, but I've helped people and I've gone to a couple operations and filmed a little bit of it. I've still got to release that video. And uh, then I also have taken packages back and used them. And uh, you can tell when packages were shook before the bees got out of the hives in the morning. Uh, so one yeah. of these operations, they were shaking bees at like 7, 30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And it, you know, the mm -hmm. it was early and it was cool and there was not a, hardly a bee out of the hive. Yeah. It, it, well, you know. I, I'm convinced that some of that is done on purpose. They will tell you that they don't want to, they want to do it before it gets hot or they want the packages to be ready to ship by noon. But I know a couple guys down there and they know what they're doing. But it's, they, they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. They're getting rid of their older bees. And forgive me, that's, I don't mean to be sounding judgmental. I know most package shakers are very honest people and trying to do the very best job they can. But just like any in industry, any group of people, you, you'll have a few that are trying to not do the right thing. They're trying to do what's best for them. So when you're looking at a yard that you're going to be taking the bees mm -hmm. from, what do you, what would you say on average you would build a yield per colony, strong colony? It's uh, like a booming colony. How much do you, do you kind of estimate one of those colonies to build a yield for bees? Well, the first round we would get a three pound package and then maybe the next round two. And then the last, I, I would go three rounds where I'm at in South Georgia, they can get four, sometimes five, three, then two, and then maybe one and a half or one. It slowly gets uh, less and less, but it's pretty interesting on the second round. You can come back two weeks later and it looks like you didn't shake anything in some cases, but you should be able to shake three pounds out of a good double deep and leave a lot of ease behind. Yeah. Yeah. So then when you shake them into the package, <clears throat> I have these, I'm going to be using these Italian packages that I got. I uh, saw those. Those were pretty interesting. Yeah. Those pretty interesting. Those the tubes? No, the tubes, they come from New Zealand. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, those, those black are... plastic things, those were different. Yeah, kind of like yeah. a clamshell. Like I could split them yeah. open, knock yeah. them in there. And the feed can up on top, he had a gel. It must have been I mean, a gel. I, I don't like that. No. My personal preference, I, I I had some of them, I used gel, and I don't think the bees did as well with it. So what would you use as a feed with, within your packages? Uh, heavy syrup, heavy syrup. 
and yeah. it's uh, and what does that look like exactly? Um, well, if you were using high fructose corn syrup, for example, which is seventy-seven percent solids, you just put five gallons or ten gallons of water in a fifty-five gallon drum. Um, I'll be real honest. Uh, I buy my syrup when I was doing it. I was buying my syrup from Rossman Apiaries because they've got the canning machine, and it was just easier for me just to buy pallets of cans already redone, already done. And then we put our holes in the cans, and the holes have to be very, very small. The okay. what I came across is that the hole for a feeder feeding can should be the same diameter as a, and you would you've been around long enough to remember what this means. Uh, reinforcement wire for a comb, the spools of wire that you buy for wiring wax foundation, oh, yeah, the yeah. very fine tinned wire, that's the perfect size hole that you want to do. And we got kind of a punch that was set up uh, perfectly for that. And we were actually using, I still have a bunch of them. I was, I was buying the needles for the old Victoria uh, phonographs from like 1920 those needles are very, very hard and very tough, and you can set them in a punch tool to where you're just, you get the hole just poking just right. You can do thousands of holes with one of those old phonograph needles. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So that package I have, it has just that uh, plastic container with the gel. Yeah. Um, so I won't be able to... Uh, do what you're talking about there because I just well, don't I'm have not that. saying you have to do the syrup. I mean, the gel no. works. I just, I, did, I didn't, wasn't too fond of it. I'm that. wondering if it would be much of an issue anyway because we're a straight shot 20 hours away. So they're, they're going to be in the boxes and then psh, back home within the next day, anyways. So it, that probably won't be a big issue then, right? Well, no, no. You mean using the gel? Yeah. Yeah, just to I, give them something to feed on, I guess. Is yeah, that's not a big issue. That's much different than coming across from Italy or some New Zealand or something. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking. You're, you're right. It would be probably a non-issue for that situation. There, there has been issues with gel in the in the past. So Man Lake, I know, had a big problem with that um, with shipping and and heat. Now. Canada d typically doesn't get as hot as it does in, in parts of the U.S., but it can get hot up there sometimes. Um, yeah, well, we're shipping. We're doing this in beginning of June, so right shortly. So it's it, it does start getting warm now. Yeah, we do see some heat. I see. I see. Well, um, I don't know. I mean, I've never used the gel before. Um, but are you, like, driving and picking these up? I missed part of the conversation. So. Yeah, I'm heading out there with the SUV. That's the other thing I was going to ask, just a little bit of feedback as as we talk to ourselves here in front of everybody. But, um, sure. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so I'm driving out there in the SUV with my wife on a bit of a road trip. <clears throat> and I'm going to bring 100 packages is what we're going to do. So, like, we're going out there to see a buddy anyways and stop to see family on the way out there. But, um <clears throat> Uh, in my Yukon, I'm going to stack them into my Yukon uh, with the window down a little bit in the back hatch. That'll provide the air through through that cabin. Do you see that as being adequate amount of airflow to keep those uh, packages cool enough, or do you think that's uh, it? Does are you going to have your back? Is there a back window you can yeah. keep open? Yeah, there's a back that's window. I was thinking of rolling down the window just a little bit. Shielding them from the sun, of course, but the wind coming in and then out the back. That should yeah. provide enough airflow. I believe so. People used to pick them up for me in SUVs like that. And it really came down to the temperature outside. Uh, it's not going to be 90 degrees up there or something like that. And, you know, uh, my advice to people is just put on your sweatshirt and keep it cold. Co heat is a worse enemy than cold when it comes to packages, in my view. If it gets 85 or 90 degrees, they need a lot of air. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're not going to... Do you think the air conditioning would keep up to 100 packages in? No, because you don't have the air flow. Right. Yeah. Hmm. That horse trailer you were pulling looked pretty good to me. That was a horse trailers work great, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, my brother won't let me use it. So uh, if steak, they, size, steak they, size on a pickup truck work pretty good too. Yeah. Forgiveness is easier to ask for than permission sometimes. <laughs> I'll just take um, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I well, we're picking up 100 packages though we're just kind of dabbling with this kind of idea it's kind of kind of a 
airbrand idea i had it just a little while and i figured oh might as well go out there get some bees to fill some more boxes here so mm -hmm. he's got a few extra colonies and we're going to shake up 100 packages and throw them in the back of the suv the suv would be a lot better drive a lot more comfortable yeah, how about your half ton pickup with some steak sides that would work nicely it would how much is too much airflow for the packages Oh, it, you know, picture your, it's really, you know, I always am using human beings as an example as what to, is comfortable for a bee. What would you be comfortable in? Mm. That's what you're looking for. Right. Yeah. Well, Ian complains about the wind up in Canada all the time. So. <laughs> I, mean, I watch those, I watch those uh, winter scenes you're going through. It's so brutal up there. We see the harshness of everything here in Manitoba. It gets so cold and windy and so much snow and it just drags on forever. And then it changes until like today was a beautiful day and you're like, Oh, this is a nice country. Then it'll yeah. get so hot and humid. Right. And, and the bugs yeah. come out. So it's miserable all the time. That's why I complain all the time. <laughs> no, I saw some extreme uh, cold in Alaska, but when it would get like 60 below Fahrenheit up there, the wind wasn't blowing so you know you guys got to deal with that darn wind yeah the wind's a curse for us yeah yeah i saw that in north dakota i spent some time in north dakota when we were running late getting out of there with the bees and oh the wind was miserable loading trucks in the wind i hated it i really did no oh, it drags you down yeah. it definitely does so just to get uh, i'll give the show back to you in just a second okay. Kevin. i just want to uh, no problem review just one thing uh, so the setup on these colonies, I'm going to have them feed them, probably gorge on syrup, so they have full stomachs of syrup. That'd be the best thing for him. Uh, cool. And he's going to prep his colonies by he's going to find the queen, put her down below the excluder. Um, so the day of the shake, what do you guys do? Do you find that queen, set her aside, and then take the bees, or do you just oh, take we, everything over the excluder? Yeah, we're finding the queen at the moment. We're going to shake the colony. Oh, we're yeah. not, you could. If he could do it, you could. If he could just put her, that's kind of problematic. Put isolate her in some sort of cage for a day until you get there. Yeah. I don't like that either, honestly. That's not good for him. No. But uh, if he's isolating her below the excluder and you're getting all the bees above the excluder, unless there's a bunch of brood up there, that's not the bees you want. No. So the best would be to hunt down that queen. I'm a good queen finder too. I'm going to be there helping them. So to hunt down the queen, set aside, I'm pretty sure I've seen you set aside the frames you want to keep with the queen and then you harvested the rest of them is what you're doing, right? Yeah. I yeah. just like to get the queen back in the box as soon as possible so she doesn't wander off. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of guys put the queen on a frame and lean it against the box. I, I, I really don't like doing that. Yeah, I want wander. her in the box. Yeah. You've, you've lost a few queens like that before, Bob, haven't you? You've lost them, yeah. Like, you know, she was here 10 seconds ago. Where did she go? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had that happen uh, this this week in a nuke. And, and typically with my, um, my my production colonies, I'll clear some space. And then she'll, if I find her, she'll go on the edge, you know, somewhere inside the box. But with the nuke, sometimes I'll, I'm bad about if I've got something to do real quick, I'll just lean her over there and but it only takes a few seconds and then all of a sudden she's in four inch grass and yeah and sometimes that's all there is to it and there's nothing worse than losing a awesome queen um well, you know, so some, i'm only going to be uh or sorry i stepped on you well, i'm uh, gonna say some people just use those little plastic things you know i don't know what to call them those, yeah, shake my fingers. They, they shape like that and hold the queen and just leave the queen in there while they're doing their shaking work i mean know really where she is yeah. Yeah. That's what you're saying, Ian. Or I was just going to ask uh, what the last thing I was going to ask <clears throat> the transportation of these packages. Uh, like we're only driving 20 hours is going to be a straight shot. So it's not a long time, but um, a, a bee regulates its heat a lot better when they're properly hydrated. And I guess that's where the syrup comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I'm not going to be using the syrup and using this uh, gel gelatin or whatever, um, I yeah. guess watering the packages would be a good idea. Maybe yeah, uh, we, we would always hours. yeah we would always take a pump sprayer or a very fine mist on a water hose and mist the packages before we would load them on a truck if we could. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, you're right. It's a big deal. They get dehydrated pretty easy, especially if there's wind going through the load. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Take a pump sprayer with you. That works. 
yeah, and just give them a shot there, maybe yeah. once or twice through the. And a lot of people will tell you to do that with light sugar syrup, but I don't like that because it gets the bee. I don't want the bees to be sticky. Oh. I, I prefer just water. Yeah. That's that's a good point. Um, so when I got into beekeeping, I started with packages, and that was one of the info. That's some of the information that I got a hold of. It was you know if you're, you can't can't get them in for a day or two, just you know, spray them in some uh, sugar syrup. But every over the years, I've noticed um, that that does not work well. I seem to get a lot more mortality spraying them and getting the bees sticky. And mm. uh, so these days, um, well, I haven't gotten packages in a long time but um the water seems to work really good just like a fine mist just yeah. you know and uh and it's cheap. oh that's good i just wanted to tap into the expertise and the experience of bob there a little bit this yeah. year has been a real roller coaster for me there's nothing's typical and and I hate these years. Boy, I hate these years. It's just so much work and stress. But at the same time, I love these years too because it it makes me think about things differently. And you know, I have this problem now. I got to solve it. And how am I going to solve it? I have all these problems. I, I I don't know how to manage. So then I I had to go out of my comfort zone to be able to manage these issues. And this mm -hmm. is this trip out there is just one of my harebrained ideas to help bring bees back to my apiary in this you know in your region so well, that's, your, your experience is going to be way better than them packages coming from overseas that's for sure oh boy they go through a lot and those guys uh, our importers do an absolutely terrific job yeah it's just do. a br brutal trip you know yeah and they 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 lose all control as soon as those yeah. pallets of packages hit the airlines because then you rely on airline staff to follow sops and that's part of the issue we're having it's just crates not loaded properly or the uh, these uh, pallets of bees sitting in the plane <clears throat> for too long or they take it out and sit on the tarmac in the sun for you know for hours it's just not acceptable so there's there's no. all those circumstances they have to yeah. manage at the same time they seem to be able to do it so if i can't make it in a 20-hour shot then uh, i guess i'm hopeless <laughs> yeah. well you know uh your experiences last spring i'd like to say were biblical <laughs> this year has to feel a little better than last year doesn't it <laughs> last year was a tough year yeah, yeah. but okay. my bees uh yeah they they were in tight shape last year and same exact the same as this spring and they bounced back and i'm kind of seeing that right now too where i was out in the that's why i was just about late for this chat because i was out and we're working the yard and i was like oh shit i gotta get back there uh the hives are just on the verge of exploding and i'm not gonna be able to keep up to them I, I, i'm pulling frames of brood and that bead of sweat's coming down my forehead because i know i'm just about to get so far behind we're not gonna be able to keep up to them so oh, we're just there and two weeks ago i thought they're all gonna die so it's, it's it's fun to watch things change throughout the season you know they're they're resilient little creatures yeah. it just amazes me beekeeping is in a an emotional sport um that's for sure yeah it um, turns me into a manic depressive all the time it's like up <laughs> and down and up and down it's just ridiculous <laughs> the worst part is our wives have to deal with us um yeah uh, but uh it, it's kind of the best and it's kind of the worst part about it too i said you know if i was telling a, a new guy that, that our preacher actually got into bees so um, I, I was talking to him, you know, people corner me and, uh, and he was asking some really good questions and I told him, one of the things that, you know, has made me love for 21 years is it's such a short window. I mean, in Canada, in some ways, um, it's way shorter of a window. Um, you know, so I've, I've got about eight to 10 weeks of honey flow where I'm at in, in a good year. I'll have 10 weeks in an average year, maybe a little less in some years. It's a really a bad year. I'll get around six weeks of weight gain. I've only had that once, but you know, it's such a short window and it's, it's kind of magical every time it happens. And then we hit that darn dearth period and our bees are robbing each other or trying to, and, and they're more aggressive and it's 98 degrees Fahrenheit and nobody's wanting to work bees that day, but you just got to do it. And, uh, you know, but you just go through these things, and uh, that's why I was telling them, I'm like, you get different seasons, and that's what makes it special. So let's get to some questions. Um, 
everyone's been patiently waiting uh, while we've been discussing things um, for queens and all kinds of other stuff. And, and I, I've learned a lot from this already, but let's see if we can get to a couple individuals' questions. And I want to say thanks to Bruce Bees for donating. And uh, he had a question uh, for you, Bob, um, about... Chris, do you mind pulling that up for me? I can't find it. It's all over the place. All right, Bob, how do you find all those queens quickly when shaking packages? Well, the, the, if we have time to go four or five days ahead of time, putting an excluder in the middle makes a huge difference because then at least we know what box she's in by where the eggs are. So that, that helps a lot. When I was shaking a lot of packages, we don't anymore. We just I got out of that. We always made a big effort to get a queen excluder in four or five days ahead of time. So that was a big difference. And then if you're shaking on a good day when they're flying, that makes a difference. You know, when the bees are flying, it's much easier to find a queen. And we do mark our queens. I mean, if we keep queen markers in our pocket, if we see a queen, we mark them on the spot. And that makes a difference, too. And, of course, you're always going to have some queens that aren't marked, supersede or whatever. But uh, And uh, back when I was doing a lot of package shaking, the, the for a while there, we were selling 1,500 packages a year. So in my book, that was a lot. To a big package producer, that's a drop in the bucket. But for me, that was a huge deal. And I had a couple guys working for me that were really, really good at finding queens, and that was kind of my ace in the hole. Getting young guys like Seth to have a good set of eyes. and Yeah, Seth's pretty good at it, and you're, you nailed it. He's, he's young. He's only 23 or 24, and... Uh, I don't remember. He's one or the other. <laughs> he's he's young, yeah. and he really can see good. And uh, and John, believe it or not, is a pretty good queen finder. All all my crew, they're all good at finding queens. But a couple of the guys that I had like eight or ten years ago were just superb. They were amazing at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not. I used to be my best queen finder, but now that I'm, you know. Uh, going to be 70 in a few months my eyes aren't what they used to be and i don't i trust the younger guys honestly more than i do myself now so here's a question from scott reese what type of refractometer was the blue one that you showed the other day um came in so honestly i i don't remember showing that but there's a lot of things that i do that i don't remember uh ask laurel um or things that i said um this is it right here. I just happened to have it on the desk. Maybe when I was doing a chat the other day, I, I showed it as well. So this is a MISCO, and it's made in the USA. They're, they're not cheap, but this is a really nice refractometer. I, I've got some uh, cheaper Chinese ones that you, you look through, you know, the classic refractometer. Uh, but this unit right here, it's very heavy plastic and, and stainless construction with a little glass eye there in the center. And I actually have some of Bob Benny's uh, Sourwood Honey that was oh, gifted cool. to me. Um, a, a fellow went down there uh, by the name of Don Bearden, and he's been with us. I think he was, if I remember correctly, he was in the 300 uh, number subscriber account. So he was very early mm -hmm. on. So we're just going to, uh, look how thick Bob's honey is right there, though. Bob's honey is always quite thick. You dehydrate it down a pretty good bit. And uh, it takes a while to get it out of the container. So... This thing's nice right here. Just turn, hit the go button, turn it on, close it. And then now that it's in there, I'm just going to hit go. And 15.1% is what it's rating for that honey, Bob, 15.1. Now, it's possible it's been sitting on my shelf here for a year in a very dry room, a little over a year. So, um, But it's this this is delicious soured with honey um, for sure. But this this sucker right here. Um, is very nice. Um, I got it from Man Lake. I, I don't know if there's other places that you can purchase these, but um, it was worth it to me at the time to go ahead and just get a fast one like this, and I, I really like it. Um, it's it's better than the, the other ones, but those other ones will work just fine. Can you calibrate it somehow, or is it just set for life? Um, it does have a menu and all kinds of options, Bob, and there's an instruction manual that comes with it. And I, these kind of devices, I go, hey, Laurel, and and then she she yeah. calibrates and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So I'll leave it to smarter people to, yeah. to engineer you know, stuff. There's a lot of uh, fancy calibration fluids and all that. Louie, who works in my warehouse, he's got it dialed in he knows how to calibrate with the extra virgin olive oil that that's works really good if you know what to do with it 
Oh, oh, Laurel thought I was calling her. I was um, talking in like uh, in a situation where I was having problems. I would call for you, proverbial. Um, anyways, she came in here. It's like, what do you need now? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't say it like that. She's like, did you need something? She's she's too sweet. Um, getting to some more questions. Chris, throw some up there, would you? Um, hmm. What is the best way to get a hive to accept a queen that just won't accept one cage straight release cells eggs this colony kills or destroys every cell i think we've talked about that one a decent bit but i'm going to uh, talk about that for just a second longer is that um sometimes colonies just get so long in the tooth they're old there's a bunch of old bees they're on the verge of being laying worker and that's something as a new beekeeper was a very hard lesson for me to learn and one that took me a long time to accept that some colonies just are not worth saving at some point and they're, it's too costly especially if you're buying queens for like 30 or 40 dollars for a colony of bees that's all old bees there's hardly any brood even if you add a little bit of eggs to them to give them some brood they still won't accept a couple frames of brood with your queen introduced they're just old bees and these days i refuse to do that um, i won't try to fix a colony that's long in the tooth that's got a bunch of old bees especially if they've already killed one queen and, and won't accept it like that i will just recombine them shake them out something else and i'll make splits um, with some young nurse bees and and good brood in a nice situation if i'm going to spend money on a queen i'm making darn sure she's going into a, a very safe environment you guys got something to add on to that yeah, if I have queen cells, you know, a virgin queen solves all issues. So, and they don't cost a lot where you put a mated queen in there and another one. The third one hurts the most, right? Because there's, well, here, it's a lot of money, over a hundred bucks already in, into it. So don't throw good money after bad. Yeah, and, and like what you said, um, the only time I've ever been able to recover bees that were slightly going lane worker is if I had some ripe queen cells I could just throw in there. A lot of times I'll take a, a frame of brood to kind of get the pheromones where that needs to be where it needs to be and um, with the brood pheromones and throw that queen cell and and like you said that virgin can f fix that situation. Um, but a good mated queen, I, man, I hate to throw it in that. Uh, a lot of times they die. So, Bob, how do you get someone to let you put bees on their property for sourwood? I live in Piedmont, North Carolina, and I want to take my bees over there for sourwood. Well, I'll bet Ian could say more about this than I can. Not sourwood, but how to find a good yard. Farmers are the best, you know. That's the first place. If you if you can uh, visit, find a farm preferably older people they relate to bees better than younger people that's where i get my best uh, results i don't like knocking on doors um, but i will do it if i have to um, bribe them say there is honey involved you know that's how it always helps and you know, but i have my best luck with farms honestly all right so Chris, why don't you just start loading us up with questions? We're going to bust through some of these people that have been waiting forever on here for their questions. All right. Are frame slash foundations that get badly wax moth worth cleaning up, or is it better just to put new foundation in? That is an interesting question, and I think depends on your circumstances. Um, who wants to take that one? I think the question is if the wax moth takes it down to the plastic, whether or not to put it back in again or uh, you know is it, is it worth basically the time to clean that frame up and re-wax the plastic foundation or put a new uh wax foundation and this is a question that some people morally have an issue with wasting anything that has use still and and then there's also the production side of the business where like it's really not worth my time to do that so yeah kind foundation's of gonna get <clears throat> Sorry, I stepped on you. Foundation is getting expensive too, though, so it, it's starting to make sense to recycle some of that back through. We're, we're actually doing some of that ourselves, uh, taking not the like we're not taking old garbage frames, and then it's not with the the wax foundation. It's with the plastic. It's very easy. Scraper down, 
or we put it in the melter for a, a short amount of time so it's easier to peel the wax off and we just drop them back into the hive so that's what we're doing because the, the equipment costs a lot of money if that the if the frame itself is you know it's if it's holding itself why not and the plastic as long as it's straight <clears throat> as long as the bees will take it again give her yeah we have um some foundations i've i've been doing a, a bunch of these we have you know foundations that go into hives um that uh, sometimes don't get drawn properly occasionally and sometimes uh, other things happen maybe it's wax moss or whatever um, give me one second i'm actually going to color all this in hey laurel grab that frame for me would you meanwhile let's uh bob you, you want to comment on that a little bit or are we good um, well i i guess i'm still in a position where I'm looking at it from a money point of view. I got to pay somebody to do that work. And if the frame isn't too bad and it's not too big of a mess, we'll go ahead and fix it. But if it's a bad mess, we just throw it away. Um, a, a weak pressure washer will clean it off really good if you can hold it down somehow. And a funny story, I had a friend who took a bunch of equipment through a car wash and cleaned all the old stuff off and he got a phone call about an hour later say we we don't ever want to see you in our car wash again. <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah, a weak pressure washer will take it off. Uh, and you can scrape it. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of ways of doing it. But I don't want, if it's an old ratty frame, I don't want to invest anything in that. I want a newer frame. But if the frame's real good and you know, it's not too big a job, we'll clean it up and rewax it. So here's a comb that I, I or a frame that I threw on last year. And they, I just don't think that there was a, a good coat on this one. I got some that were single coat um, from a company I won't name. And uh, it, just, I, it was a little too thin, but I was in a hurry. And, I, and in a good flow with a strong hive, it had worked out. Likely this was in a situation where the flow had ended or um, they went queenless. And a lot of times when you have a queenless hive, they, they draw stuff poorly um, not all always but I, I find a lot of times when they're doing funky stuff there's some type of issue going on queenless uh, strong dearth whatever whatever the reasoning for it was they just built like a patch up here and a little patch over here and this was all bare down in here and you can see where they they've taken a lot of this just down to the plastic and whenever we get in a dearth period where there's no nectar coming in, the bees are, are stressed. Maybe they're trying to repurpose the wax, um, or they're just bored out of their minds, and they'll pick it off. And back when I started beekeeping, we used only solid wax foundation, no plastic. And in those cases, during a dearth, bees would just chew holes through the entire thing, and they would waste it. And I, I was talking about this with someone the other day, and I was wondering why would the bees chew that wax off? And could it be that there is some um, attrition with the wax. So as the bees um, cap the brood, there is a mixture of wax and some propolis, a tiny bit of propolis, I believe, in those cappings they put on the um, the cells. Could it be that if some of that's being chewed off and some of that's dropping down to the bottom board, it never gets reused, and could they be picking this off and putting it in those places? I, I don't know. Um, regardless, in this case, this is a good, strong frame. We're going to put some beeswax on this and throw it back in. Um, I just, I've got a little roller here, and this, when I'm watching a little bit of TV or something like that, I will roll a few hundred of these. Um, or, better yet, make my kids do it. They're starting to get old enough to do it. <laughs> um, all right, next question, Chris. All right. Chris probably went to the bathroom. <laughs> Cayman, have you found that your VSH queens to be a little spicy? Um, yeah, they're a little, they're spicier than my bees are for sure. Um, I've had a lot meaner queens than that. Um, however, um, they are hotter than mine. Um, but I, I, while while Corey's breeding for vsh and stuff like that i'm focused on um totally different traits i one of the things i'm looking for is gentle bees and not running all over the combs 
EFB and chalk brood resistance, those things. But um, yeah, his are a little bit hotter than mine. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give Corey a phone call and tell him to fix it immediately. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, they're really, mine were not that hot though, but just a tad bit hot, warmer than mine. Um, let's see right here. Made, could you use a queen pheromone strip temporarily in a starter while waiting on a new round of graphs? Thoughts? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure it'll keep them from trying to raise emergency cells, but is that really what you want to do? You know, I... They, they have some, on the JZBZ cages that you get, they have um, a smell to them, and they say that that's um, like queen smell or something like that. They impregnate into the plastic. Have you guys ever opened up like a 100 pack of JZBZ cages and smelled that strong smell from it? Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it's quite strong. And um, I had one guy, it's like, that's, that's queen pheromone they put in there. Like, I wonder if I could just hang one of those in there, if that would be enough it, itself. I don't think it would be. Um, but there's there's all kinds of beekeeping hacks. Like, uh, have you, you guys ever watched them? Um, I'm sure you have. A few of Paul Kelly's uh, University of Guelph videos. Um, you know, he's one of the speakers of the conference. He's got the University of Guelph videos up there in Canada. He's got one on those um, little polystyrene mini nukes. And he's got a video series on that. And they use little pheromone strips when they um, he either mentions it or he uses them. Or they staple them in there for when they make them up so the bees kind of, you know, glue into those little boxes until they the cells, um, you know, get in there and emerge and all that. Um, so... I don't know how to answer that person's question, but it, it, it is a head-scratcher. So, let's see. We'll take us a few more questions. We got some up top. Holy cow. I just scrolled down. Have you ever found that when you roll extra wax onto your frames, it widens the cells and you get more drones? No. Um, no. Um, Ian, um, did, you, did you dip yours in to get wax on yours? How do, how do you get wax on yours if you would repurpose them? Yeah, I bought a bunch of uh, cheap Chinese foundation for a really good price that come unwaxed so what one thing we did is we would take the sheet and just dip it in it worked really well you had to make sure that the foundation was warm if it was in the cold room and you dipped it in it just you know it flake off so that worked but it seemed to uh there seemed to be a lot of wax on there so i thought that was a bit of a waste so then i had the kids i had like five or six expendable uh labor right expendable <laughs> and, labor. yeah they're using the paint roller to do some of that so i kept them busy for a while and they got tired of that and then i gave them a block just rub it on that that works as long as i just get a little bit of wax just on the top of the um, the cells just a little bit that's all the bees seem to need and then psh, they build it but yeah it's a lot of work that, that i think i'm gonna buy a waxed right. foundation next time because it's it's kind of a pain in the ass <laughs> but this is a really good deal <laughs> so it, it's what we got to do so that what well, you said it, it's it, it's cold so if it gets you know cold it flakes off and i'm like i've had some fairly cool foundation in winter time and i've had not had any issues but then i'm thinking Oh yeah, he's in Canada. <laughs> it, your your cold and my cold are quite different. My my cold winter days are like, oh man, we're the high today is twenty five degrees Fahrenheit. Man, it is a cold one. You know, and uh, you're like, oh my goodness, what a warm winter day. It's twenty eight <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so all right, I I that makes sense. Um, so. Wow. Yeah, those those queen's cages smell quite strong. And, and I have some commercial beekeepers who say they don't like the Jay-Z BZ cages for the fact that they do have that strong smell and they think that could actually impact a queen acceptance. I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, I know a lot of people use them and really enjoy those Jay-Z BZ cages. I like how slender the profile is of them myself. Um, versus a wooden cage. 
Um, maybe that's a – let's get to this question right here real quick. And then, Bob, I recently introduced successfully five of your mated queens. I got second hand and noticed buck fast written on the orange cage holder. Can you provide some background on that? I would have no idea how the word buck fast got on there. I don't think we would have put it there. Yeah, I don't think that – you never talked about buck fast queens in your operation. Is there even really hardly any buck fast truly – around mm -hmm. anywhere not in this country yeah that's kind of what i was thinking interesting i wonder if someone was jotting somebody, some notes down i we usually don't use second hand orange queen chippers i don't remember doing it recently i guess it's possible uh, but I, I i people that work for me would have no reason to write that on the on there so i i guess i don't have a good answer mm -hmm. Pro probably you know the Whoever uh, bought it from you guys wrote that on there um, Possibly, afterwards. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's see here. So that was the question I was going to ask. You guys have introduced a lot of queens over the years. There's a lot of different queen cages out there. There's a California-style queen cage, kind of the old classic wooden three-hole uh, drilled queen cage, wooldn queen cage, and then JZBZ, and there's a few other options. You guys have any preferences on queen cages just for practical use? I do. My favorite cage is the California wooden cage, but you don't see them much. <clears throat> Little square cage. There's no room for attendance in it, but you know you don't want attendance in your cages if you can help it. So, why would it? Why would you pick that um, for your own personal use and for maybe shipping? Well, because it's small, and you can the Benton cages. I hate them because they're you gotta get them in between the combs and you almost can't have 10 frames in there and do it without really mushing a comb. Mm -hmm. And those little wooden California cages uh, have a small footprint and you can get them in there very easily. And also um, they don't have quite the issue. If you look at the, a Jay-Z BZ cage, the bees can actually grab the queen's feet a lot easier than they can through one of those wooden cages that have that finer screen on there. Interesting. I think you have less issues with the wooden cages and the screen. And I like the small footprint of the small California wooden cages, but I, you don't see them much. I mean, there's hardly anybody using them out this way. Right. I think most people have gone to the JZBZ system uh, like yeah. I have just because there's so many compatible pieces, yeah. the shipping containers, everything, yeah. yeah, very yeah. interchangeable. Yeah. But that's interesting about the California queen cage. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people who really like those, um, and I've read some <clears> books <throat> where <clears throat> people have brought those up as being their favorite. So um, <clears throat> that leads me into um, another question. So Ian's talking packages and whatnot. Um, I have seen, like when I first started, I was and got all my packages. Um, they were all from Wilbanks out of Georgia, and they always had a lot of attendance with the queen. I mean, we're not talking three or four. Usually there was five, six, or seven attendants in there with the queen, which I always thought was pretty excessive. Um, uh, but they seemed to do okay. Um, I was at a, some other places this year, and they had no attendance in the cage in a package and there was a lot of issues i but i didn't know there was other things going on as well and i, I kind of wonder what your thoughts on that are for packages bob having just the queen in there or does she need attendance in that case since she's pretty foreign no she doesn't need attendance in that case in that case uh, the reason for having six or seven attendants in a benton cage that's the only one you'd want to put that many in would be uh if you know if she's shipping outside of a queen bank shipping box and she if she's stuck in that cage for four or five or six days the extra attendants are helpful because they can begin to die off at some point true and one of the biggest concerns i would have is maybe the the candy's just a little tacky and the queen get a little gummed up and those bees can help keep her cleaned and groomed perhaps um, yeah and but uh, that mm -hmm. seems like a lot and this was the first time I'd ever seen a package that did not have any attendance in it at all. And I just, but oh. there were, there was, there were some poor issues and I just wondered if that associated with that or not, but it doesn't no. sound like that's the case. 
No, not if not if the queens are being taken care of properly before they are introduced into the package cage. If they were, I mean, obviously, if a queen's sitting around for a day, it, that she needs attendance, you know, mm -hmm. unless she's in a queen bank of some sort, whether it be a box or a colony or whatever. Uh, I don't like to see a queen sit alone for more than an hour without attendance or something. And, you know, I'm not an expert on that. I'm just, some of what I'm saying is my theory, not my, necessarily my understanding, but uh, you can't have a queen sitting around for a day without attendance, I don't think. Well, I, I don't think anyone's going to argue that you don't have more experience and knowledge about this than we do. <laughs> so we're, we'll take your word for it. Bob. Well, I've seen a couple names pop up. I'm wondering if that Stevens guy, is that Steven or Stephen Roberts? Or uh, Steven no, no, Stevens? that's Stevens Beco. That's Corey Stevens. Well, that's Corey. Oh, Stevens. yeah. He, he's just like, uh, he's a, he's pesky like that. He just should have known. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, Stevens. Yeah, I know another Steven. I was confused. Yeah, Stevens Beco. That's Corey Stevens. And anyone that's interested in getting some virgins and all that kind of stuff, um, yeah, they they've been very productive, and and Bruce has had good results with those. Um, so um, mm, there was a question for Ian up there. Well, there's one question for Ian. Weren't those that were in the tubes? Ian just got the California cage. Was that a Cal? I didn't see the the no, cages. No, they they were little square cages. The queen was by herself. <clears throat> Very unique, J just for the package itself. Yeah. So I've never seen them in a tube like that before. I'm, that's probably not a U.S. thing. Um, maybe not in Canada too, but uh, is. Why would they be in a tube? Um, is it they ship better on a plane or something like that? Or yeah, they seem to ship very well. Like they stand them up, right? So you have the tube, and you have a vent up top and a vent on on the bottom, and they have um, kind of like a, a mesh material down inside where the bees can hang on to, and that's where the queen is stapled. Is it on that mesh inside, and the the bees hang on that mesh and then hang on the top. And I guess the idea probably is heat rises, so the 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 uh, all the heat will escape straight up through the vent and probably keeps them cool. And the, they pack them uh, just about one kilogram or a little bit more than that, maybe. Uh, and they stack them in a crate. I, I'm not sure how many they put into a crate, but it's a, as much as they can fit in. Yeah, like a four by four or four by five. That's pretty wild. Yeah, it works very well. They they seem to they come through just masterfully for me this last time. Uh, that's cool. I mean, I, uh, obviously that those came from New Zealand, right? So In New Zealand, yeah. yeah, they do things quite a bit different. They've come a long ways. <laughs> they have come a long ways. Laurel, uh, uh, and I would like to take a trip down there and see some beekeepers. It's, it's a very different place to keep bees. We have several people that come on here from New Zealand from time to time and come, and I'm sure they visit your channels as well. Um, <clears throat> so, so do you think the bees got jet lag, Ian? Did they have a problem with that? <laughs> they were pretty grouchy when we were hiving them. <laughs> I had to put my gloves on. They were little bitches. But then we went around today had to pop the corks because I don't like to release the queen when I'm shaking the packages in. Just, yeah. you know, there's too much going on. She'll fly away maybe. <laughs> so we pop the cork and just put a little bit of honey in there just to slow her down from releasing and they're nice and gentle and happy again because they were feasting on the sugar pail all day so there was one um that you just had up chris about rooting for ian and um that's that's yeah. summed it up pretty nicely ian your raw oh, blog yeah. style video has me on pins and needles so suspenseful <laughs> my family is rooting for your success well that's and, good to hear <laughs> I th well i think there's a, a, a lot of people thousands of people that feel that way about it and uh it's quite the interesting little adventure I'm doing on this YouTube channel. I, I don't know. It's kind of taken its own path. I'm just putting everything that I'm doing out. Well, not everything. We do a lot of things on this farm I don't put on there. It's just whenever I feel inspired about certain things about the bee farm itself, I have my camera and I put it in there. So it's it's a feedback mechanism more than anything else for me. I read a lot of comments. I get a lot of emails and it's just a continual discussion. It's, I think it's benefited the way, well, it's benefited. I, I did it first off to help convey myself a lot better public speaking in that, but it's, it's helped me provide a feedback me 
mechanism where I'm talking to myself and then others are joining in, helping me with the conversation, trying to figure these things out. So I can't go to my old man. He doesn't know anything about bees. So like, <laughs> where do I get this stuff from? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a comment from Rylan, uh, Opinia, and I'd like to say thanks for his donation. And apparently he's a fan of Bob. So, uh, oh. King Bob, um, oh my. apparently that's the thing now. So, um, no King here. No, no, sir. no but so, you know, Someone's going to wear it. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> um, if, if you see it, okay, I'm going to say it. So if there's, a, <laughs> if, it's, if there's a shirt at Hive Life that says King Bob on it, it was not me that made it, okay? I, I'm not going to do that to you, Bob, but somebody else will do it probably at this point. Um, well, it has to have a picture of a minion on it. You remember that movie, King Bob in the Minion movie? Well, I, didn't, I didn't know if you had seen that, actually. Um, so my oh, yeah, kid... I, love, I love the Minions. That's oh, great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> King Bob. Yeah, I had young kids, at that, younger kids at that time. It was good stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. So what about, the, there was a, someone that asked you about um, your copper smoker, Ian. Where'd you get that from? Is that up there in Canada somewhere? I don't know where it come from. Uh, Brad Hogg gave it to me as a, a, a gift. Um, this is before I actually, I think before I really started. Brad and I, we, we uh, are good friends now. We're on the association together and we're like four hours apart and that. But he was following my uh, written blog before I went on to YouTube on my web page. And so he sent me this thing. I was like, where did this come from? Because there wasn't even a note on it. So, oh, this is really cool. So I put it on the shelf and I took it to the schools. It's, it's really, it's a good looking smoker. So I took it, it to the schools on my demonstrations and it looked really good. And then <laughs> I run over my smoker. I didn't have one. So I ended up starting to use this one. And it's a good smoker. Yeah, It, it is. Uh, it's a, it's beekeeper bling um, is, is what it is. And, and that comment right there, Chris, you, you're, you're supposed to do your job and filter out anything that's, uh, that makes fun of me, and you didn't do your job. Uh, Ian, did you ever solve your problem of tainted water on your, your pals? An oh, yes. No problem. Yeah, yeah it's only a problem when it's a problem. And it's like, son of a gun, my bees are really poopy coming out of the shed. <clears throat> And I had nosema issues and it was escalating because of the weather. And then it would rain and I'm looking at the entire, like the bees fly out and they poop everywhere on the hive lids, on the, the ground. You can see it on the ground. It's just poop everywhere and on top of my pails. So then when it rained, you have these little poop puddles up on top. And every time I pass by, it's like, darn it, I bet you that's full of nosema too. If it, if these bees have the nosema infection and they're pooping and voiding, that's good. It's getting out. But if they're pooping on top of my pail and then the water from the rain is making it into a little puddle, which they didn't come and drink it, then it might just be, uh, you know, uh, infecting my bees with nosema every time it rains. So I went out there and I took a little dab in one of the pails and put it under the scope and look, sure enough, there's a shit ton of nosema in that, on the top of the pails. So I don't know what to do about it. I tried um, cutting the rim, like uh, the pails have that little rim around the top that holds the water. So I, I, I uh, took a knife and I uh, gouged it down, but the pails are kind of, you know, um, concave the concaved in yeah so it, it held the puddle anyways so uh, mm. the other thing to think is, is just fill it in or the other thing is just to cycle the pails through the honey house and wash them get all that poop off and move them back out that might be the most practical thing to do more work for the kids yeah you um, kind of left us all hanging on that video you know that right? i was like what well i want to know he's been watching too many videos from hollywood that cliffhanger the season cliffhanger yeah. Yeah, I'm playing YouTube. I'm making money on that. You know, suspense. <laughs> Make you come back for more. But the thing yeah. is, I haven't found a solution for it. I don't know what to do about it, other than to cure the nosema, and that's going to be a hard one, mm -hmm. or clean the pails because I can't modify the pail at all. It won't work unless I, I fill it with silicone, but that's too much money. Mm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Laurel has a lot of opinions. You all, uh, it's it's too bad. She's... Um, She's super, super smart and hardworking. Um, when it, and she talks to me very freely. Let me tell you, she's she's I'm old news. Um, but uh, whenever she gets to know somebody, she talks quite a bit, and um, and and it's a lot. 
it's not like me where you have to sift through all the, the stupidity to get to some interesting stuff. Laurel's always very interesting and very intelligent. Um, so Kenneth Bach um, asks, are you, any of you guys looking to use the, the Amitraz gel? They're referring to the new stuff Vita Pharma is releasing. Um, I, I haven't looked fully into it, and honestly, it's one of those things where you, you kind of got to try it. You know, there's a lot – all the companies – um, and I'm not trying to pick on them in, in particular, but all the companies will say this product's going to get you this kill and this kill. And, and probably in those trials, they they did achieve that kill. But the problem of it is over an average, I don't always see the same <laughs> things that they see. And it could be that the trial was held in California and the humidity is a third of what mine is here. And that could affect the the treatment or whatever. So I don't know a lot about it. What are your guys' thoughts on you know, maybe a, a, a gel amitraz. I like an, having another option. Yeah, we can't use it in Canada yet, as far as I know, because I don't think it's registered up here. We usually lag behind you guys. But if it does get registered up here, I think there would be a place for its use, maybe. It's more of a, I don't know if you consider it a flash treatment, but it's like the app. The Apivar right now is an extended treatment. You need like 52 days or maybe even more if it's cold. And this one is like a, within a two-week period, I believe it is. Uh, I'd have to double check on yeah, that. I'm pretty sure you apply it once, and then you're, sp you're only supposed to do it two times, if I remember the literature correctly. And you would do two applications that are supposed to go for seven days. But it's it's more of a flash treatment, and yeah. they recommend it being used um, – it was really designed for commercial beekeepers in mind where you're making time splits or you're doing something that's going to make this more effective because you're you're using a biological um, thing in, with a treatment. Um, for those of you who don't understand what I'm, I'm meaning by that, is basically it's hard to kill the mites if they are in the brood. And you got that capped brood and those mites are down in there reproducing. But if you're making a split where there's very little capped brood or no capped brood, and then you use any product really works pretty good when there's no capped brood in the colony, um, or at least works a lot better. So it, it'll be interesting, and we actually will have them on in the near future live. Vita Pharma is going to come on and talk about their product because right now uh, there's a lot of speculation, but their researchers know a lot more about this than we do, so I'll be very interested to hear on what they think um, and how it should be used correctly. So if you guys have any questions or things for that, um, they will be on um, a live chat in the near future. Um, so there was a question up above, and it was about uh, frame feeders. That, and that's the thing. Um, there's a lot of different ways to keep bees. Ian's got his system... Uh, I know Ian probably doesn't feel this way about it, but I look at it as a very dialed-in system. You know, sometimes your s systems and circumstances that are out of, out of your control don't always work the way you like to. Kind of like, you know, your pell feeding um, obviously has served you really well over the years, but now with the nosema, it's a little bit of a pain in the rear end having to deal with that issue. And someone brought up frame feeders up above, but the system that you have really revolving primarily around a single brood chamber really doesn't seem to work too well, I would think, with a frame feeder or over winter with a frame feeder. Yeah, we could go through and put the frame feeder in. Yeah, we could do that. I just, I've never, I do have a big stack of those things in the yard. I've never really, you know, I, I found more use in just kind of flashing syrup to them on with pails or if we would need to feed a lot to them at a, a time, then we just give them a bigger pail or sometimes a good way with open feeding so that's just the way i've managed my bees I, there's a lot of beekeepers maybe that move their colonies around more uh, maybe would want to have an internal feeder because then it's always with them and then they can drop some syrup in and, uh, and bob uses internal feeders maybe you could comment more about it well i i use them in double deeps but i really stay away from them in singles because i don't want to be limited down to eight frames yeah that's like in a double deep, you can afford to lose two frames. When I was traveling all the time, the bees always had a feeder in them because no matter where they went, there it was. Yeah. I could use it. Nowadays, I don't worry too much about it. You know, they both have pros and cons. The frame feeder is good for gaining weight fast, and I prefer the bucket for kind of metering it out slower. 
but my situation is so much different than yours. We have a lot of then Caymans in the same position, you know, through the month of August into September, we're just trying to keep the feed on them. But if you, I don't want it to be a flash flood of feed and then nothing for two weeks. Uh, we're better off keeping them kind of slightly fed over a long period of time. You have, you don't have the time for that. You got to get food on, you got to get it on right now. So um, I see you're using those screens. They, they, the bees can take a lot of feed through the screen in them buckets. And I used to have two gallon buckets with screens and I, you know, I use those plugs now where we just put a few holes in them and make it last longer. And that's really what works for me. Hmm. You know, the, the frame feeder, I think we're all looking for something better, but like a frame feeder and it's has a use bucket feeders have uses, but there, they, there's different pros and cons to those approaches. I wish we could find something that had the best of buckets and the best of frame feeders. And then we'd just be set. Um, but that'll never happen. <laughs> yeah. I remember the, the one time that I did use them, I spent some money and I, I bought some and I was using them and <clears throat> I quit using them because of the condensation would accumulate in them. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the, because of the colder weather, I guess, I don't know, but the condensation fill it up and just be a, a feeder full of sludge. It was gross. Yeah. And I was dumping yeah. those things out and washing them up all the time. And I said, screw that. Cause I needed, that's when I was trying, that's when I had doubles and that's when I was transitioning to singles. So that just went aside because I needed all the space in the bottom anyways. And the pails are just so, so very easy. Yeah. Very easy. So, and that, and that was overwintering. You would get that water build up, or that, or that be through the season. They just no through the winter. Yeah, I'd leave them in the there. That way I wouldn't take them out. I'd, and that's maybe my trouble. But taking them in and out, that's a lot of work. So I, I just left it, it is. in. It is. Well, that's something that we've been scratching our heads about because um, I don't use an upper entrance in any of my colonies um, to let any humidity out or condensation out um, in the winter time. And most of the time, my feeders do just fine, but I do end up with some of them that end up with uh, two, three, sometimes even four inches of water down in the bottom of them. And I know there's not a leak in the lid. It's a good lid. Um, but they typically are the ones that I have those foamy things on that, you know, you, um, and I just don't think any of it gets out of there. And but the bees half the time are okay. There's a little bit more, it's a little more humid than I would like, but it, my winters are nothing. I mean, this year we had about three legitimate weeks of winter and that was about it. In my opinion, it was a pretty mild winter overall. We had one serious cold snap. My bees did just fine. And I, I say this around here a lot. If you can't, if, if the winter kills your bees, it, it's more than likely that you did something wrong in late summer um, and, and early fall that's what beekeepers in the south need to really work worry about is keeping those mites low making sure that they have a good queen in there and and plenty of food um, but the frame feeders um they definitely aren't perfect and i do hate hauling them in and out um mm -hmm. question that you guys might be able to answer better than anybody that i know is a single brood management a lot of people scratch uh, scratch their heads around um scratch I can't say anything. You know, it's about time to <laughs> go to bed. Uh, um, there's a lot of people that wonder about single brood management and how to make it happen. And we utilize it now. And I know that you use that all the time, Ian. I think, Bob, you've used that or do use that. I don't know to what extent. Um, but um, you'll kind of talk about that a little bit. And I'll insert one more question in there to make it more confusing. That... I've typically had very good success this year. I've had a little bit more issue with my single brood. I, I cut them down to four frames of brood prior to the honey flow, but I've still had a little bit more of a tendency towards swarming than I'd like to see. But we've had really good pollen flows this year, and I feel like that's clogged up the brood nest more than it has in the past previous years. Um, so kind of... You know your thoughts around single brood management, and and then if you get a lot of flux of of pollen, you know what do you do about it? Yeah, I guess basically it all depends on what you want to do as a beekeeper. What what are you trying to achieve? It's just you know you're just not going to manage a single box because you know that's what Ian does or that's what Bob or Cayman does. It's just what is it that you want those bees to do, and why are you managing them in a tighter space like that? 
And I have a lot of reasons for that. And that's why I've gravitated this way. There's beekeepers up here that uh, manage in doubles because that suits their style or it just, you know, maybe they can, uh, it suits their style, their bad habits, and, and they just seem to do better with doubles. And there's a lot of reasons for that too. For me, I'm looking at uh, maximizing uh, uh, space for one thing, I indoor winter. Um, it's I fi find it's a lot more effective to manage mites because it's a, a smaller area. We're using less medicated strips and uh, the mites can't seem to get away from the medication, especially with the vapor and you're putting the vapor in, it's a smaller enclosed space. That's a big thing. Another really important thing is, is kind of twofold, is I'm trying to keep the summer honey out of that brood nest. For one, so I can harvest it and make money. But the other is so I don't allow my hives to winter on that summer honey. And that generally is canola. Canola makes a terrible winter feed. And when I find canola down in the, the brood nest, especially, I don't necessarily see problems with it on typical type years is the tough years, like the, the two that we've just gone through where the winter is a little bit more extended. And they just don't do very well on it and they suffer. So I'd like to manage my nest so the bees take all that honey and move it up over the excluder so then I don't have to do that. Then I can backfill that nest with uh, a premium winter feed, which is sucrose. And they do a lot better through the winter shed that way. I also find it a lot easier to read the nest. You know, you know what you have. You have six frames, you have eight frames, you have two frames. You're not trying to judge the size of that nest between two boxes and trying to figure out, you know, the management of the brood and all this kind of stuff. It's just the dynamics around managing uh, the equipment in that single box is a lot easier for me anyways to be able to uh, direct to other people as they're trying to help me do some of this work here. So I'm, I'm very specific to the reason why I'm doing it in that single box. And I guess maybe in some ways it's a bit of a lie too, because I'm not always managing in a single box. There's beekeepers that try to manage in a single box and they're married to just managing in that box and you can't put that second on ever because then you're not managing single box management well they don't understand what exactly needs to go on because there's times in the year especially right now where they're about to explode you got to give them two boxes to allow that queen to manage a bigger nest to avert swarming so then it gives you time to get around everything to be able to do your work right so it's a manipulation of that nest and the outcome that you want of that manipulation and i find it a lot easier to manage it within that single uh, uh throughout the year so i'll pass it on to you bob <laughs> yeah you're you're in such a different position than i am um i'm kind of, i this may be the wrong word but i'm an opportunist beekeeper i'll do the best i can with what's sitting there at the moment and in my yards, you might see double deeps and singles in the same yard. And it's, I know when the sourwood flow is going to come. And I don't want to be building up a second box on sourwood in midsummer. And that's why you'll see a lot of singles in, in my yards right now. Because if they were a late start or perhaps they swarm, you know, we'll shake them down into a single. And that's how I'll make the most sourwood honey, which is coming up, you know, in a little over a month from now. And I'm going a lot. Of, I sell a lot of beehives too. Some years I sell a few hundred. A few years ago I sold almost a thousand. And I prefer to sell a single than I do a double deep because you make more profit that way. You know the difference in a value. The difference in what you can sell a double deep for and a single is not worth the extra box. You know how, how do I say this properly? But I'll just show up. Throw out some numbers if you can get say 250 for a single, but you can only get 280 or 290 for a double. Well, the, the, that second box full of whatever's in it is worth a lot more than $40 to me. So I want to get a lot of my colonies down to a single this year in order to sell them. I'd, I'd like to sell 800 to 1,000 colonies this fall for everybody that's listening. If you need some bees in September, <laughs> get a hold of me. There, there I love selling it, colonies and then building back the following year. And so, uh, but, but, but I like, I, but I prefer to manage double deep colonies. 
So if I know a colony is not going to be sold, if I know that yard's going to stay put till the next year, I'll prefer to run it as a double deed. So it's just, you know, whatever's happening in the moment. And if Seth, Seth's probably long gone by now, he's got a girlfriend, he's probably not still on here, but he always is telling me, we never do the same thing twice. Last year we did something completely different. Well, I can get away with that, but you, Ian, you can't do that. You, your season is so tight, so defined. You don't have the leisure of uh, flexibility that, that we do in Georgia. And I can play around and do whatever looks best in the moment. And two weeks, what I did now, two or three weeks later, may not be the most valuable thing to do for me, you know, depending on where, when the honey flow is coming and you know, what I'm going to do with that colony. I, I, that's a vague answer, I know, but no, it's, it's real. Things be different, yeah. I shudder when I think about doubles. It just uh, just sends a shiver down my spine. I hate doubles. <laughs> <laughs> I do everything see, I can not to. Well, one of the reasons I like doubles is because we do so much splitting, and if you have doubles, you have so much more to work with. And there's really, you know, I can't speak for you in Canada, but in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, there is absolutely no doubt that. Uh, if you overwinter in a double deep with a good colony, you're going to have more bees to work with in the spring than you will with a single. So if you're, much. If you're, yeah, if you're making packages and making splits and doing all that, you've got a lot more to work with if you've got a double deep. So that's something to consider too. Bob, is there a day you can always be found at the store? Uh, Saturdays mainly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, and, uh, where, where, where can I order, Bob? So you're going to get a bunch of emails, uh, people wanting some singles from you. So you might be able to sell as many as you want to, Bob. Well, hopefully. Uh, I'm glad I was able to uh, self-promote on this list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to take the, this conversation and take it one step further. Is I don't even, like I, I prefer managing singles, but I also like to manage them even smaller than that into nukes like I, I, yeah. I build these nukes and i manage them way to be able to maximize my honey crop on them by making them smaller right so i'm making these nukes and i'm forcing them up a lot quicker instead of building out and up and you know build them and they go straight mm -hmm. up and make me that honey crop then the honey crop comes within three weeks four weeks and i need to get them into the, those honey boxes right away so you know mm -hmm. my manipulating the space for the colony it, it's, it goes back to exactly what are you trying to achieve so what i'm trying to achieve with some of those smaller spaces is just trying to maximize my honey crop a lot of ways keep that honey crop up top instead of down yeah. below right so yeah that's I, I, a huge focus for me i absolutely believe that if you manage singles properly you will make more honey but you also will feed more too you do put syrup into them yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's... Although I don't know, you know, uh, well, I'm not going to say ah, that's, you know, <laughs> but I've managed doubles too. And I, my feed bill hasn't been a lot different from the doubles to the singles. Maybe they eat more. Maybe I'm just feeding them too much of that time. I don't know, but it's just if it, as smaller. I always think the smaller units are more efficient, but then you go through two springs like I just did here. And I wish I would have managed them in doubles because they would have been a little bit bigger. They would have had a little bit more resource on them. They would have had more girth. Right. And I would have just gone through springs just like that. So there's trade-offs like Corey Stevens. He's probably not here. He, he always talks about trade-offs. So that's one of the trade-offs is, you know, we manage a smaller unit, more efficient, not as much money put into them, blah, blah, blah. But the trade-off is maybe they're a little bit smaller and maybe they can't withstand six and a half months of winter, right? So, you, you know, guys, we, we're we going to go seven more minutes. We're going to make three hours. Um, I yeah. did not plan on keeping you guys on this long. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's been – I've learned a ton of stuff from this. Um and it's also made me think about some things a little bit differently as well. Um, props to Bob for being the consummate scholar and down to earth. Hey, hey, I don't know what that consummate word means, but um, uh, <laughs> it's got to be a good thing. <laughs> it sounded really good. Uh, we're beekeepers. We don't we don't know those ten dollar words. Um, but yeah, Bob is a uh, pretty cool. Um, you know, uh, Bob, how old are you? I'll be 70 in November. You're November baby too. I was born in November. In November. Are you, were you born in November? Uh, yeah. November that's, part, 3rd. that's part of our problem. You know, we're Scorpio. So we're, you oh, know, yeah. yes. 
So my wife's a Scorpio too. So that's two Scorpios married. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about that, but now I've got to find out. Um, you know, uh, but yeah. So, but you don't act like you're seventy at all. You told me the other day we were. Well, the other day it was the last time we spoke at a place together, and uh, you're like, "Hey man, I, I'm kind of slowing down a little bit," and I'm like. Hey. Bob, you're slowing down more than any guy my age is doing. So, I mean, um, it's, yeah. you're, you're still putting a lot of stuff out there and, and you, you've taught yourself a lot of things too. Um, and I'm not trying to pick on you at all. I just actually quite the compliment where a lot of people in your age group refuse to embrace technology um, for what it is. I think technology is a double-edged sword for sure. But like this YouTube, I think has been really um, helpful for the beekeeping community. You, you creating a lot of really good content and providing a lot of good content um, to myself. I've learned a ton from you. I think Ian's probably learned a thing or two. Oh, for sure. Um, and, and being able to, to share. So you know, we really appreciate you um, taking the time to, to learn all these things that really most people in, in your generation don't take the time to learn all this newfangled stuff. Um, it, it has been newfangled stuff for me too. Trust me. You, I, uh, when I started making YouTube videos, I, well, let's just say I've learned a lot too. You know, I've, it's really stretched my brain cells out truly. Well, you've, you've called me a few times and, and a lot of times I had to get Laurel to help you out. But, um, <laughs> when you first started the YouTube channel, um, but all the editing and stuff um, you've done, your videos are always really well put together. Uh, and that's something I find really interesting is that the guy mentioned that earlier, Ian's videos are, um, you know, just like really raw, you know, kind of gripping videos. I consider myself more in between um, where mine are semi raw, but um, also more for hobbyists and, and sideliners and smaller guys like myself. And, uh, and I'll bring guys like you on to, to provide insight on your worlds. And then Bob's got a totally different way of presenting. And it's it's quite interesting, the dynamic there. And I, I appreciate you guys very much. I appreciate you coming to our, our conference as well. That was a lot of fun. I, my only regret is um, it was so short. Um, and Can I ask little... one question? Sure. And, and maybe, maybe I shouldn't ask, and maybe he doesn't have an answer. Is Ian going to be able to come to the next conference? I have to be invited first. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. No pressure. Thanks, Bob. Um, I just assumed it was understood. That I, okay, I'm going to shut up. I'm done. Well, I'm you know, Ian's, Ian's one of those things. I mean, it's, there's a lot of foods like this. Small doses, you know. Um, you know. Yeah, it's best to probably stretch me out a little bit further. That's right. No, we, we had a great time, um, and it's not something that is not off the table at all. Honestly, um, that's part of my problem is since we're running um, hundreds of hives, and, and, and really, it's my fault. Let's just be honest here. Laurel tries to warn me before I jump off the cliff into doing too many bees um, or trying to do too many YouTube videos or too many speaking engagements, and, and we're not as smart as you guys I'm not as smart as you guys yet where I haven't learned how to utilize um, help through employees and other things like that. But that is coming. It's been quite a growing process to be able to get where we are. And the conference takes a lot of time. So I'm really behind on a lot of things. I have people every day asking me if they can become a vendor. I have folks asking me if they can plan their trip because they're wanting to come from Africa or another country and prep their visas. And it's very... Uh, humbling and, and an honor to be asked those things but uh, to my shame I, there's just not enough time in the day um, to be able to get it all done so um, Ian's definitely not off the uh, the billing um, one of the things that we've we've often considered doing is even if the person wasn't going to speak just ha bringing them out anyways or maybe just have them give one presentation and then just be there for the camaraderie. Um, Hive Life is about networking as much as anything. And we really want people to come there and be able to learn, um, to gain friends, and to also go in the trade show and be able to see the product firsthand, 
meet the people making the products, be able to provide instant feedback like, hey, this is a product that I really like. I don't think pe people understand how important that feedback is. Uh, I got an email today. Um, I, I was kind of feeling a little down, and this fella uh, said the nukes that he bought from us were just doing really good and how much he appreciated it versus nukes that he had purchased in the past. And and uh, that, that, that really mattered to me. It, it, uh, I really appreciated that feedback. And I, I've had some people at Hive Life who um, produce products, and they're like, man, this has been great for us. Not so much for – I mean, we've made money, but the most important thing that we've gained is insight on what the people actually like – and people are coming up to us and going, hey, could you do that? And some of them, you know, this beekeeper that has three hives have, has given this company a whole brand new idea that was actually a good one. And that's what Hive Life is really about, is about the networking and uh, putting that energy back into the bee industry. Um, it's so, It should be exciting. So um, you know, we've run into three hours. I didn't mean for the last little bit of it to be dwelling on my conference or anything, but... Um, Boy, I appreciate you guys taking a lot of time out of your day, and um, thank you. We, uh, we got a lot of really nice comments, um, people thanking you for you guys coming on. If there's anything that I can do for you guys, um, you know how to get a hold of me, and I won't charge you anything except a, f you know, a few bad jokes along the way. <laughs> so, you all, no, it's um, been fun gaming. Uh, I have like I've been watching and the conversation on the farm has been uh, working. So they hadn't needed to call me out to the field. So it worked out quite well. <laughs> Carrie was out in the bee yard. I think she just got back at eight. So, but, you know, she got the work done anyway. So it all worked out good. In the Bl end. Bless her heart. Well, um, yeah, if you guys need anything, let me know. Um, Bob, Ian, thank you guys so much. Anything that you got to say before we uh, turn off the lights? No, just a pleasure chatting with you, Cayman and Bob. It's nice to see you again. Very yeah. Nice, so, yeah. yeah. Thanks for fielding my package questions. That's kind mm -hmm. of I it came and said, you know, I want to have you two on there. I said, well, I'm going to hijack it because I have some questions I got to ask Bob. <laughs> it's very enjoyable. Yeah. We went places I didn't expect. <laughs> all, always fun. Well, all fellas, good, all good. Uh, have a great rest of uh, your weekend. We'll talk to you later. Everybody, thanks for coming on and Happy beekeeping. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.